So this is um, I'm on the phone. This is uh Brian Clebash from sixty one Duffield. Hi, 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 Ryan. We're, we'll we'll get to you shortly. Right. Um, we have a meeting agenda we're going to kick off here, so um, I'm going to get started with the agenda. Um, kicking off, I um, want to welcome everybody to tonight's meeting. This is the January 2023 meeting of the Community Board 2 Health, Environment, Social Services Committee. My name is Brandon Smith. I'm the chair of the committee. And I'm going to read a brief announcement, uh, which we typically do at the beginning of each meeting. So uh, let it be known that this meeting is being recorded for public access and archiving in accordance with the New York State Open Meetings Law. It's a practice of Community Board 2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee member cameras on. Public attendees are also encouraged to leave their cameras on, particularly if you're given the floor to speak. We ask that all attendees please keep your microphone muted when you are not speaking. To maintain an appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members, board members at large, and the general public. If you have questions that fall outside of public comment time, please type your questions in the chat panel. We will address them as time permits. You may also email the district office at any time outside of these meetings. We're committed to providing access to all of our neighbors, regardless of physical ability or limitation. If anyone requires accommodation or access for full participation, please contact the district office 72 hours before any public meeting. We also ask that everyone speaking or presenting use plain language, speak at a moderate tone, and frequently ask if you are speaking loud enough. If presenting, Read the title of any slide and describe any images on the slide, such as photos, graphs, and charts. Finally, I note it's our practice and our expectation uh, at Community Board 2 Hess Committee that everyone attending every meeting that we attend conduct themselves with respect. That means whether you're a board member, a staff member, a member of the public, a member of the committee, a liquor license applicant, an attorney, um, any other person who is attending this meeting, you must treat everyone else here with respect. Um, any questions get posed to the chair and uh, anyone who's found not to be acting in respect with, in a respectful manner will be removed from the meeting. I'm going to now proceed with introducing the rest of the committee. Um, first, I would like to uh, have my co-chair, uh, Nicole McKnight, introduce herself. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nicole McKnight. As Brandon mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the committee and a community board member. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Thurston? Hi, I'm Jessica Thurston. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the secretary of this committee and of the full board. Thank you. Ms. Cumberbatch? Good evening, my name is Monique Cumberbatch. I'm a member of this committee and of Community Board 2. Uh, Mr. Varela? Hi, my name is Alejandro Varela. I'm a public member of this committee, pronouns he, him. Um, thank you, Ms. Einhorn. Hi, my name is Lindsay Einhorn. I'm a member of this committee and the board. Um, she, her, my apologies for keeping the camera off. I'm a little under the weather and I don't wanna subject you all. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. I don't think I missed any other committee members, but if I do did, please announce yourself. Um, um, Emily Anadu. Um, oh, hi, Emily. Happy New Year. Um, Emily Anadu, um, member of the Health Environmental Special Services Committee, as well as a member of the general board. And I hope you feel better, Lindsay. Thank you, Emily. I'm sorry. I couldn't, I, can, I can't keep track as our meeting numbers are, are growing. I did see board member Esther Blunt here. We're honored to have her here. Um, having quorum at this point, I'm gonna move forward with the agenda for the evening. The first item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Um, 
So before I forget all that I said about moving forward on the agenda, let's worry about the agenda first. Is there a motion to adopt tonight's agenda? A uh, motion from Ms. Thurston. Uh, does anyone second the motion? Second from Ms. Einhorn. Um, out of the committee members, is there anyone who opposes the adoption of tonight's agenda or would like to abstain? If so, please say so now. Okay, let's con consider tonight's agenda adopted. Um, next up, adoption of our previous minutes from December of 2022. Does someone want to make a motion? Motion from Ms. Cumberbatch. I'll second the motion. Um, just noting in terms of discussion, there were two small things that I will email the secretary separately about. Um, otherwise, I will ask, is there anyone who opposes or abstains from approving the December 2022 minutes? I abstain, Brandon Alejandro. No, Mr. Varela abstains. Anyone else oppose or abstain? December 2022 minutes. All right. So we will consider those minutes approved. Next, I'm very honored to offer a segment we do at each health committee meeting focused on COVID-19 updates. I encourage everyone, whether you're here for this or for something else, please pay attention to this update because this is something that can really help you, particularly at this time of year. At this point, I'm really honored to turn it over to our colleague, Ms. Anadu from the committee. Um, Ms. Anadu, the floor is yours. Um, great, and I'm just waiting to get share access um, and then I will take it away. Um, all righty. Okay, one second. Oh, no. Stop share. Sorry. Sorry, it's great. Free. Sorry, it's been a while, the holidays. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, here it is. Okay. Okay, so got that. Um, happy New Year, as I've said multiple times. Um, so here we are, as Brandon said, with another update on um, COVID in just New York, Brooklyn specifically. So just looking at New York numbers, um, you know, we just keep heading in the wrong direction. Um, so right now, just for comparison, in December, the percent positive rate was about 13%. Um, but just even for more perspective, last March, that number was about 1.94%. Um, so COVID is not going anywhere. I know we're all very fatigued by it, but again, it's not about thinking about ourselves. It's about thinking about our neighbors and family and friends who might be immunocompromised and won't just bounce back from it. So these numbers are stable, but that just means that it's been higher and it's coming down um, a little bit, but still very high. Um, one thing that it does look like uh, that we missed, unlike the previous two years, is that you see um, in December, I highlighted that for the past two years, we've seen spikes as people start traveling and gathering with friends and family. While there's still, um, we still have, you know, a couple of weeks to see cleaner data, it does not look like we had the same kind of spike. Um, so again, I know some of these numbers sometimes seem like they're in contrast because on one hand you see that we don't have a huge spike, but then you're seeing that the numbers are the double uh, digit percentage for positivity. Um, this was just re this was just a really bad time because this is when Omicron was happening. But again, um, stay vigilant to get um, vaccinated. Speaking of vaccinations. Um, the bivalent um, back vaccination, which is the one that basically covers Omicron and Delta, is still encouraging people to go out and get vaccinated, particularly since, you know, most places you can get not only the COVID vaccination, but a flu vaccination. So sadly, um, from December, when we last reported on numbers where there was about 9% of residents that had been vaccinated, that number is only up to about 12.5%. Um, and so again, just encouraging people it's not over, get vaccinated. Why spend time being sick or in the hospital if you don't have to? 
Um, and while Brand didn't mention we typically focus on COVID, I thought it was um, helpful to just show what is happening because I know a lot of us are hearing, hearing about basically what people are calling a triple pandemic because you have COVID, RSV, and flu all happening at the same time. So just looking at these charts, what you're seeing is um, not to be doom and gloom, but basically these red lines that you see at the beginning, that's basically this flu season on the left and this RSV season on the right. And so in 2020, interestingly enough, which is the low blue line that's basically on the x-axis, that's basically when COVID was happening. And so people were just washing their hands and basically staying away from people. So things, so disease that you would expect to be bad, viruses like the flu weren't as bad. But um, again, just as overall fatigue and is growing, um, just in people being sick of hearing, I think you just unfortunately see that, you know, everything is trending up. So again, just reminding people be vigilant, um, both, you know, COVID continues to be present and you have RSV. Mr. Nadu? Yeah, it looks like we just briefly, <laughs> Nadu, yeah. you're breaking up a little bit there. Yeah, but... Um, yes, I think I, but I'm um, done with that, but just basically everyone stay vigilant. Um, yes, okay, that's it. But please let me know if there are any questions on the presentation. Well, thank you very much for, for your presentation, Ms. Nadu. Um, I, I, I feel like I might have missed a little part of it there because you froze for a little bit. Um, I, but I, I, I got, a fair amount of the gist of it, and I don't want to completely rehash the, the whole discussion, but I will open it up first to questions from members of the committee, and, and but mostly just thank you so much for your consistent updates on this important uh, area. Any questions from the committee? And I know that we have several new folks who don't um, often come to our committee uh, attending tonight's meeting. And I, I want to encourage anyone else from the public, if you have a question about Ms. Anadu's COVID-19 presentation or any board members, to please raise your hand at this time. This is regarding, again, the COVID-19 presentation. Um, looks like we have a raised hand from Mr. Meyer. Good evening. Uh, the question I have is there's a new variant that's been reported and being uh, has become the uh, uh, most uh, is uh, are the vaccine against uh, effective against the new variant? Um, I'll report in more detail on that one um, next time, Sid, but because some of the information I found, at least because I try to stick to just the official NYC gov for sources, just because there's so many, there's so much different news um, out there. So right now, the only, the bivalent is the most updated. So no updates have been made to that to take into account any um, updated variants. But what's not clear is how much the bivalent controls for the new variant. Um, so great question, but again, just um, trying to stick to NYC sources and that wasn't, there wasn't a clear and consistent answer, um, but I'm sure by next month we'll have some more information, but thank you for that question. I'll make sure we follow up on that specifically, Sid. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Sid. Board members, Sid Meyer, we're honored to have you. Thank you for joining. Um, and Ms. Anadu, I think you did just about as the best that you could answering that question and keeping in mind none of us are um, our, our, our doctors here. Um, we I appreciate your efforts on this every month. Um, so not to take anything away from that, but I would like to move along in light of tonight's agenda. The next section on the agenda is called Open Session for Public Comment on Adopted Agenda Items. So I want to preface this discussion with uh, one key thing, which is this is a point in the agenda for the specific agenda items that we have um, open to vote tonight. Uh, which are our new applications, 295 Front, 85 Flatbush, um, for anyone to, to make a, a, a short two-minute comment about those, those items. 
Um, but I would just offer this too. Uh, we're gonna hear from the applicants on each of these items. And once we hear from the applicants, there will be a separate opportunity for anyone uh, to have their two minutes to discuss any of these items once again. And it might be more beneficial to do that at the later point in the agenda because then we can all be operating on the same information. But with that said, uh, we do have this opportunity here. And if anybody wants to make a comment, I, I open the floor for public comment on our adopted agenda items. If you can raise your hand, that would be great. And please use the raise hand feature. How do I do that? I don't know how, know how to do the raise hand feature. Well, Rodrigo, I got you, all right? But we're gonna, I'm, I got you in the order that we came in. So uh, I'll ask Miss uh, Juliet from Bridge Plaza and then I will go to Rodrigo, and then I will go to Aruna, and then Charles, who are the people I see who have raised their hand so far. Um, Hi, good afternoon, or good evening, Juliet Ebelli from Bridge Plaza and Bridge Plaza Association. There are a number of uh, residents from the neighborhood who are here tonight and will probably uh, comment during the, after the presentation of 85 Flatbush Avenue Extension, uh, full liquor license, uh, but I just wanted to note that we are here and present at the meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much for your 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 message. We 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 note that you're you're all here, and it's nice to see you all again. Um, Mr. Gilbert, or I'm sorry, I mentioned I, I I hold on one second, Mr. Gilbert. I mentioned Rodrigo could have the floor. Mr. Mr. Rodrigo, please feel free to take the floor. Mr. Rodrigo, are you muted? Sorry, good evening. My name is Rodrigo Poches. I request that the board not recommend Cannonball's application for a liquor license at 295 Front Street in Vinegar Hill. As a longtime resident, I understand how fragile this community is. My family has a significant investment here. We own and pay the property taxes on four of the historical buildings. The neighborhood is a tiny, quiet historical neighborhood with a suburban feel to it. It is a place to raise a family. It is a unique place. We want to preserve that. We want businesses that understand our neighborhood and work with us to preserve the character of it. Our location next to Wallabout Bay makes for natural acoustics. Sound will reverberate across the area. Cannonball, intentional or not, has acted in bad faith. No community outreach for input. Manavillas became aware last week this was being planned. Our streets are narrow. Hudson Avenue is about 22 feet wide, including parked cars on one side. Front Street, about 30 feet wide, including cars parked on both sides. Tour buses and large trucks get stuck here and have to be guided out in reverse. Safety is an issue. We've had issues with our infrastructure, such as city trees, sidewalks, and hydrants being damaged or destroyed by vehicles constantly parking and idling on our sidewalks. No doubt a nighttime event space will attract a dangerous increase in vehicles from taxis to tour buses compounding the problem. There will be an increase in nighttime noise pollution heavy on the base right above our heads. This will shatter the tranquility of the neighborhood. We want that peace preserved. Vinegar Hill is quiet after 9 p.m. We want businesses that will close by that time in order to preserve the tranquility for the residents. I ask that the board not recommend the applications for liquor authority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodrigo. And again, I just wanna emphasize for folks who are here for a liquor license, it's great to know that you're here, but it would be really helpful, I think, to have the discussion at the point in the agenda where we, we can have that conversation about the liquor license, because there will be a specific point in the agenda where the liquor license comes up and we'll, we'll have the full discussion. Everyone will have an opportunity to be heard. And I, I wanna make sure that we, we, we allocate that because we're, when we speak now, yes, you have the right to be heard, but we're, we're delaying the, the point where we get to that point in the, in the, in the meeting. Um, Mr. Gilbert? Yeah, thank you for that clarification. I, 
also wanted to address my serious concerns about the application for 295 front. So I'll hold my comments for when you think it's the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. I will definitely give you the floor when we discuss 295 front. Um, Ms. Uh, Akinian, is that correct? Yeah, Hikinian, yes. Um, I was just curious, I was looking at the agenda and is 29 Ryerson on the agenda for tonight or is, okay, because we've received a notice saying it was tonight. So can you uh, let us know when would be a better time to participate in that discussion? Well, Ms. Hikinian, we have meetings every month on the first Wednesday of the month and sometimes applications get laid over. We can't say for certain, but what will happen um, often, and I would pay attention to the front of the location because they have to post on the location when the meeting is gonna be, that if uh, this location is gonna come back for next, next month's meeting on the first Wednesday, they'll probably post shortly before that. Oh, because it says on the notice that it was today, which is why I'm right. here. And uh, just along with that, it said that opportunities for comments were due today. So does that also mean that that window is extended? When it comes, as it comes to the community board, absolutely. Uh, there's, okay. when, when, when an application is laid over, it doesn't mean that it's gonna go behind closed doors. It means that it's gonna come back at a different meeting. So there'll be an opportunity for comment at, the, at whatever meeting we decide in the future to, um, to discuss uh, the Ryerson Avenue location. I think the original plan was for it to come to today's meeting. I don't have any information as to why it was delayed, but I understand it was delayed. All right, were there any other comments for public session? All right, hearing none, I'm gonna move forward into the next item on the agenda. We're delighted to have Miss Megan Nelson here from Heights and Hills. Um, she is the co-caregiver program director and will be presenting on the topic of opportunities to support Brooklyn's older adults. Ms. Nelson, are you here? And are you prepared to give your presentation? I am here and let me just, yes, I am going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Here we go. All right. All right. So thank you everyone so much for inviting me to be here today. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Mr. Smith. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Megan Nelson. I am a licensed master social worker here in the state of New York, and I am the director of the caregiver program here at Heights and Hills. So in the agenda, I know that I'm billed as opportunities to support seniors in the community. Um, so I'm not just going to speak about my own program. I'd like to give you all just a little overview of the services that we offer and some opportunities that we have for volunteers. I really rely on these outreach events to the community to let folks like you know what services are out there for older adults. These are free services funded by the New York City Department for the Aging. So you yourself might not need these services, but as you listen to the presentation, you might think of a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a family member who could benefit. And I would love for you to pass this information along to them. So just a little overview of exactly who we are. As I mentioned, we are funded under contract with the New York City Department for the Aging. That is our primary funding source. We do also receive um, donations from the community. We have some grant funding as well, but primarily we contract with the City Department for the Aging. We're a community-based nonprofit with a mission to promote successful aging here in the community. And we're based right here in CB2. Uh, we have been here since 1971, since our founding, and our offices are right here at 81 Willoughby Street. Go. So next I'm going to overview each of our programs. Um, first up is our case management program. This is a free program to support older adults who are age 60 and over 
who want to remain safely in their homes um, and are mostly homebound. This is our program that oversees Meals on Wheels delivery, and we also um, assist with access to benefits and entitlements. We strive to help our case management clients understand what benefits and entitlements they may be eligible for and help them access those. Next up is our Park Slope Center for Successful Aging. Um, Formerly known as senior centers, we are now calling these older adult centers, um, but we think of this as a center to support successful aging. This is located in Park Slope at 7th Avenue and 7th Street. We welcome anyone age 55 and over. Um, you can come participate. There's a free hot lunch served Monday through Friday, and we offer activities, discussion groups, and events. Our staff at the center really strive to make the activities and groups really engaging and interesting, um, want to be more than just bingo. And we really have developed a very vibrant community there at the center. Caregiver program is of course near and dear to my heart. We are here serving family and informal caregivers. So you might be helping out your grandmother who has dementia. You might be supporting your spouse who has cancer. In that case, um, we are here with information, assistance, counseling, and resources to help you navigate what can be a very challenging landscape. We serve, uh, if you imagine sort of the top northern two thirds of Brooklyn, so Greenpoint and Williamsburg south to Windsor Terrace, um, and then Red Hook all the way out to Brownsville in East New York. That's our service area for our caregiver program. So if you or someone you love is a caregiver in kind of a northern two thirds of Brooklyn, that is where we are. We also offer educational workshops and support groups to our caregiver clients. And we have some funding for short-term respite care to give caregivers a break if they qualify. This is where the opportunity to support seniors in our communities comes in. This is our volunteer program. We recruit volunteers of all ages. Um, I believe volunteers can be as young as 16 if they are volunteering alongside a parent. Um, we're always looking for friendly visitors. Friendly visitors are screened and trained and then matched with homebound older adults. And the idea is, is that this is an opportunity for both the volunteer and the older adult to make a new friend. We really make an effort to match folks based on their interests and their personalities. We want a successful match to be something that is mutually beneficial for everyone involved. We're also always looking for volunteers for our shopping squad. Um, this is an initiative that began, of course, during the pandemic when it was so difficult for older adults to safely access grocery stores. Um, this is an opportunity for homebound folks to give us their grocery list, um, and then volunteers will take care of the shopping um, and bring the food to them. We do have funding for that program to support the purchase of those groceries. And we also have special projects from time to time, especially around the holidays. Um, right now, actually, we are still, we have some volunteers still coming in. We have some special gifts that were donated by a local, uh, local company. And we are matching them with homebound older adults who might enjoy a gift this time of year. And we have volunteers from the community who are coming in, picking up those gifts and delivering them to their homes. Anyone can apply to be a volunteer. Um, we would really welcome your interest, your applications, whether you are coming as an individual who would like to get more involved in your community, or perhaps you'd like to volunteer as a family. Maybe you have a group at work or a group of friends who would like to be involved in a special volunteer project. We would love to hear from you. Um, please reach out. And in order to do that, this next slide is our contact information. So our main number for our office at 81 Willoughby Street is 718-596-8789. Again, 718-596-8789. For the caregiver program, you can dial extension 307. That rings my desk. For case management intake and Meals on Wheels, the extension is 325. 
And if you're interested in our volunteer programs, their extension is 335. Finally, if you'd like to learn more about the Park Slope Center for Successful Aging, their number is 718-832-3726. So I'm going, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I would welcome any questions that folks may have. And again, thank you so very much for having me here today. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, thank you for, thank you for posting all that information in the chat. I really appreciate this that. Is, this is how we do it here at the, at the HESS committee. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Thank you very well much for your presentation. <laughs> We, we we greatly appreciate your your presentation and, and really uh, and are, are happy to learn more about your your organization um, is there anything that you feel people in the community or otherwise from the board can do to best support your organization and its efforts what a wonderful question there are so many ways to support us um, of course, we always welcome donations and fundraising, um, but perhaps even more importantly, we welcome your advocacy in your communities. And that can be a community as small as the block that you live on, the building that you live in, your friends at work, letting people know about our services and the fact that there's so much available here for homebound older adults and their families. I think a lot of times this can be an overlooked population, um, but it really shouldn't be. You know, so many of us, whether our families, friends, neighbors, or people who could maybe use these services and benefit from them. So spread the word, let people know that we're here. Again, all of our services are free under funding from the New York Department for the Aging. Um, and then of course, finally, we always welcome those volunteers if you're interested in getting involved that way. Great. Um, any questions from members of the committee for Ms. Nelson on uh, and her wonderful program? Brandon, I have a question. Of course. Mr. Varela, go ahead. Um, thanks, Megan, for the presentation. Years ago, um, uh, Carol Ann Church was very involved in, in uh, raising awareness around NORCs, the naturally occurring retirement communities, and all of the funding that comes at various levels of government. And I wonder if your organization helps in any way to organize the older folks who come to seek services so that they too can seek out. I think what we learned in that process when we were surveying uh, the, the district was that a lot of people didn't even know what a naturally retiring, occurring retirement community was, didn't know it came with funding, didn't know that in their own building they could qualify because there were enough people who had aged into the sort of requirement. And I, and I wonder if your organization in any way partners uh, in that way or provides information or support? So thank you for that excellent question. And I'm so heartened to hear about your knowledge of NORCs and your involvement in, in organizing NORCs. That's fantastic. So we absolutely advocate for NORC funding and NORC organization. We make sure that our clients are aware um, that that is an opportunity that may be available to them. We also do a lot of advocacy for our clients who may already be living in NORCs, but may never have availed themselves of the programs and support that are offered. At the same time, we are not as an agency, NORC specialists. The NORC specialist agency here in Brooklyn is a group called JASA. Um, and we dovetail with them quite a bit in terms of the services that we offer in different neighborhoods across the borough. So we do work hand in hand with JASA in terms of supporting their work specializing in NORCs, just as we are over here specializing in case management and caregiver programs. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. Um, any other questions from members of the board or Ms. members of the public for Ms. Nelson about her presentation? Well, thank you very much, Ms. Nelson. I greatly appreciate you coming to us and letting us know about your work. And we will um, be interested to see what great things that you all We'll, we'll do in the, in the future and hopefully some folks will be inspired to support you um, from our, um, our, our attendance here tonight. Well, thank you so very much for having me. And I wish everyone here a very happy and healthy new year.
Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Well, next up on our agenda, we have our new liquor license application reviews. The first item on our agenda is 295 Front, entitled Cannonball LLC. Do we have someone here re representing that establishment? Hi, yes. This is Heather Kirk um, from Hellbron and Levy as the representative. And then also with me is Andrew Tarlow and Elizabeth Murray, the applicants. Okay, great. Um, we should have your application posted shortly. I think I received a question from somebody. Does do 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 folks have to post their? Uh, was I saying that people have to post their notice whenever their license is renewed? My comment was about when folks are uh, are applying for new liquor licenses. I'm not a liquor license attorney, so I I, I can't speak for the specifics of, of all of the requirements, but I, I will say that my comment was specific to new liquor licenses, not renewals. Um, Ms. Uh, Kirk, please proceed with your presentation. Uh, great. Thank you, Mr. Smith, um, for having us here tonight. We appreciate the invite. Um, like I said, I'm here with Andrew Tarlow and Elizabeth Murray, and I'll turn it over to them in just a moment so they can introduce themselves and the concept a little bit more. Um, for the moment, I'll walk you guys through um, pieces of the presentation that has been provided to you all already. Um, Cannonball LLC is a catering license establishment that is coming before you guys at 295 Front Street on the corner of Front and Hudson Avenue. Uh, the catering business will be located on the seventh floor of a commercial use building, um, and they will only occupy the seventh floor. On that floor, we'll also have a terrace that opens up outside. Um, their hours of establishment are Monday through Sunday, 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. Um, again, this is a catering establishment, so it's not open to the public. There won't be reservations where people can come in. And in addition to that, they're not curating their own events. These are private events that are booked by uh, clients of their um, establishment. Um, there's also, I, it's in front of you. I see it on the screen. It shows the number of tables and chairs. Uh, this is a open floor plan. And with catering establishments, the floor plan can change depending on the event that's taking place. Um, but that is an approximate of what the space um, would look like. Um, I will turn it over to Andrew and Elizabeth to do a quick introduction, and then we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Hi, my name is Andrew Charlo, and I have been living in Brooklyn for 30 years. Um, I want to thank you guys for letting me talk. I am actually a resident and member of CB2. I live in Fort Greene, and I have a restaurant there as well called Romans. I hope you all have seen it and been there. We've been there for over 15 years as a um, restaurant. Uh, my motivation is always and will always be to bring people together, and this business is an extension of that. We have been working very hard over the years to be a community-based business. And over the course of owning restaurants for 24 years in Brooklyn, I think we've established that we have been good members of the community and have been solid and able for people to come and reach out if there are problems or if there are questions or people have concerns. Um, this new business that we're opening, we used to have this in Red Hook and we have lost lease there, um, is definitely an extension of what we do. I mean, it's about having people's very special weddings and anniversaries and parties there. Um, it is not a place to have a nightclub or a rave of any sort. Um, a lot of these people are similar to everybody here on the board. They all come and eat at the restaurant and they all want to have their most special day with us. Um, and it's an honor for me to be able to do that. We, um, these businesses have all, I think, uplifted and supported the communities that they have been in. And I hope that I can do the same for Vinegar Hill and obviously the surrounding CB2 as well. Um, 
I think if you guys grant me that privilege, you know, I think you'll see that I am a good neighbor um, and that I am able to be reached out to. I have, as I said, you know, nine businesses currently in Brooklyn. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm going to leave it for questions. I know Liz has some, Liz, who is the CEO of our company, has some things she'd like to say. Hi, everyone. Uh, really thrilled to be with you all this evening. Um, yeah, just to sort of reiterate and what Andrew was saying, we run businesses that are deeply embedded in and parts of the communities that we operate inside of. I'm also a Brooklyn resident and have lived in Brooklyn for 10 years and care deeply about uh, this community, all of our communities. Um, we employ as a company a little over 200 people currently. We're hoping that this space will enable us to hire another roughly 25. Um, we pride ourselves on being a, a good employer. We offer far above um, average wages and a comprehensive benefits package that's really actually quite rare for this industry. So um, paid medical, dental, and vision benefits, uh, robust paid time off policy, including paid parental leave that's in addition to what the city and state offer, um, a 401k with a company match, and uh, a financial assistance fund for any emergency needs for our staff. Um, on a personal level, Andrew and I are both also really deeply um, in service to our communities. We both sit on the Small Business Services Hospitality Council. I also personally sit on the New York City Hospitality Alliance Board of Directors and on the Culinary Council for an a really wonderful organization that I hope you all check out called Emma's Torch that works to train and employ um, incoming immigrants and refugees to the city. I also, since the fall of 2021, have been training as a community mediator through New York Peace Institute's mediation program to provide uh, mediation and facilitation services to help New Yorkers in neighborhoods and communities better, better uh, be in dialogue and understanding with one another. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to do that with all of you this evening. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I appreciate your the information that you shared, and it's nice to know that you're supportive of employees and 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 different communities. Um, I want to start the committee questioning and with uh, just a couple of things that I'd like to know first. Um, I think you'll hear from many residents tonight that Vinegar Hill is a uh, residential community. And um, I guess uh, I would start because really most of these projects start and considering you're very community oriented, what kind of engagement have you had to date with the Vinegar Hill Association? And do, are there signatures of support from residents uh, that would, that would um, uh, support this application? And then I guess, when are you planning to open? Yeah, thank you so much for your question, Mr. Smith. Um, we have our the staff actually who operate this business. We wanted the people who are most closely associated with operating the business day to day to meet the residents. So they've been in the community since last week meeting with people. We have about 70 signatures of support um, for the application. Um, and Andrew has been in contact with friends who are part of the Vinegar Hill Neighborhood Association and spoken to some other uh, food business operators in the neighborhood, all of whom voice their support. So um, I think we're in the early stages of what we anticipate being a decade long relationship with the community. And when did you say you were planning to open? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we're in the lease negotiation stages now, so probably end of this year, 2023. Okay. Are there any comparable types of establishments near this location in Vinegar Hill in terms of operation or hours? I don't or... think so. There are other, there are other event spaces, I believe in community board too, of course, that under your jurisdiction, but they're much larger and I think much different than ours. So our, we have a, we currently operate a space through the end of this month in Red Hook. And the the concept is very similar to, if not identical to what we're do, we'd be doing in Vinegar Hill. There's small, it's a small event space of roughly 80 to 125 people 
um, the Vinegar Hill space will be very similar, which there's nothing really. The one thing I want to say is I think that makes us a little different is that most of the event spaces in CB2, the people who rent those and have the licenses do not operate the food and do not operate and run those businesses. So that space that we spaces. have at Front Street, they're basically empty spaces and anybody can rent them and a new caterer and a new vendor can walk in and they can throw the garbage on the street and they can do whatever they need to do because they're never going to be there. In this case, we are the actual people who will be cooking and cleaning and serving and making sure that our phone is open to anybody in Vinegar Hill if they need, you know, if they have any complaints or concerns we are here because we actually are the ones who are going to run it. I think that's the one difference that is unique because we come from a food and hospitality background, not a space rental background. And almost all event spaces are actually space rental businesses, more like landlords. Um, the only time we would ever have a secondary vendor work in our space would be for a religious wedding, which would more likely be on a Sunday if we had that. Currently, we don't have that as a business model. But just to put that in everybody's mind, the only time we would not cook would be if it was a kosher wedding or if it was some kind of halal scenario. And then our operators and events would still, staff be, would there. still be the ones managing the event. It's a it would it's that this point is really critically important. Okay, um, I I have so basically one of you is going to be on site at all times when there's a a, a, a well, private event going on well there will be a gm for that business and okay. a chef there'll be multiple you know that team now is currently 15 employees and so probably once we get this going we probably would grow to about 20 to 25 employees easily so yes there'll be someone who's in charge of maintaining the sidewalks, maintaining, just like we do for a restaurant, maintain all things that we touch and all things that we affect, we will have somebody on site for sure. Okay. Thank you. I have other questions, but I'm going to let members of the committee ask their questions. Um, I, I, I see Mr. Varela has his hand up. Thanks. And then, um, hi, sorry if you're my kids in the background. Um, hi, uh, Elizabeth and Andrew. Thank you for the presentation. I'm, I have a few questions. One was the, I see in the application that number of seats is 150. Does that reflect the capacity for the space? No, that's supposed to be just for the guests. Well, doesn't include staff. So I'm curious about what the total capacity is for the space. That's one. Confirm that it was seventh floor of this building is what you said. Um, mm -hmm. Curious about how the outdoor space, what it faces and how, um, what the outdoor space faces. And then lastly, what is the frequency of, uh, of events that you had in the Red Hook space? And do you expect something similar at this one? How often were they happening? Yeah, so um, we believe that our capacity is 150 without staff. So seated, ideally. Um, we haven't, you know, we haven't applied to DOB, so we don't have full approval of that yet. We're still waiting on that. It is on the seventh floor. The deck is on Front Street and Hudson. Mostly, well, I guess it's equal to both. It is a L-shaped deck. And so basically that part of the building sets back. The frequency of events, I think we probably did about 60 events last year in Red Hook which was busier busier for us. We also do run an offsite catering business. So we do go to people's homes. We do go to businesses. We do, you know, we will actually go to Dumbo in this and do some, you know, probably drop off meeting lunches and things like that. Um, I'm not gonna lie, the rent is not inexpensive and or nothing. So I think we are trying to, we will try and book most as many days as physically possible, right? I mean, we're gonna try to operate the thing. Um, but again, you know, this type of business that we're running also includes corporate events. It doesn't only include like a wedding and or a bar mitzvah or a anniversary, right? It also includes lots of those businesses in the Navy Yard, maybe like, 
you know, Wegmans wants to do their corporate Christmas party or they need to do their corporate meeting, right? We do, we will also reach out to all those types of businesses as well. And one of the reasons, you know, this location has been so, you know, interesting to us is one, because I do live in Fort Greene. So it is literally a bicycle right away. My kids go to school, you know, right at the other side of Fort Greene Park and the middle school for community roots is just like two blocks away from where this location is on Front Street. Um, so I'm super familiar with this area. All my, all four kids have gone through this same school system. Um, we are equally also building a new she will facility, which is the bread business that we own. And we operate at Fort Green Market, if anybody wants to go see it, um, in the Navy Yard. So it sort of consolidates a lot of our businesses. So there'll be a lot of, of our, out of the 200 plus employees, right? There'll be a lot of internal energy moving towards that side of Brooklyn versus where we are in Williamsburg right now in Greenpoint. Okay. I'm going to move on to Ms. Thank well, you. What, sorry, Mr. Varela. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't allow you to finish your statement. So. No, no, totally, totally fine. Thanks, Brandon. Ms. Thurston. Hi, I have a few questions. And um, for if I may, I will, uh, as the board secretary, encourage your direct answer of the questions and encouraging brevity here so we can hear from community members. Um, but in anticipation of some of the feedback that we'll receive and have received, um, first, I'd like, to, I'm just going to list my questions first and I'll let you answer them. Um, first, um, you stated that you had 70 letters of support, but it was not clear to me um, about your answer to Brandon's question about whether they're actually from the community. So I'd love to hear that as number one. Number two, you suggesting your at outdoor hours until midnight every single night. Though I will note for members of the community, the application is very clear that there will be no music outdoors. Um, so I'd like to just confirm that you will not have any music of any kind outdoors um, at any hour um, as per your application. And I'd like to suggest that you, or I'd like to ask whether you might be amenable to not ha having the terrace be open until midnight on weeknights. This is indeed a residential neighborhood and I share folks' concerns about the noise on a rooftop until midnight. Um, so I'd love to hear your answers to those questions and thank you in advance. Thank you. Yeah, so the 70 so signatures are all from Vinegar Hill specifically. The team, as Liz pointed out, canvassed that neighborhood um, and exactly that five block radius or six block radius. Um, and stayed within a two block radius. Sorry, I stayed in within a two block radius. Um, what was the next question is? Mm. Outdoor space, if we'd be open to having the music. Uh, the oh, no, no. The second question was about music outside. So we're not going to have music outside. That's confirmed. That's confirmed, yeah. And then the next one is- um, If we would be open to- I would definitely be open to closing the patio a little earlier if it was to appease the community for sure, Sunday through Wednesday. And you know, I think we can even talk about- Thursday. You know, Thursday. I think also it doesn't, just because we have the ability to serve till midnight, I don't, you know, I might be open to not having people outside, you know, after 11, if it really became an issue. I think what I would really ask, I know nobody really wants to talk too long, is that you, and I know no one trusts anybody in this day and age, but I am completely open to hearing people's concerns throughout this process. And I understand that the business will change and the neighborhood will change and things will ebb and flow and your requests might change in the future. Okay. You, say, you know, Thursday, I need 10 o'clock and I'll see what I can do. Well, it will be in your license. So careful <laughs> with that commitment. <laughs> um, and just a reminder that when community members, when we get to that part where we invite you to speak, please do keep it to under two minutes and address your questions to Brandon, the chair. Um, thanks. Ms. Cumberbatch. Good evening. Um, to speak to some of the concerns around parking, is there any arrangements that you plan on making with local businesses in reference to parking for events at your space? Yeah, I mean, currently all our events are really handled by Uber, more or less. 
Um, I know that the Wegmans parking lot is very close. So I think if it really became an issue and there were lots of parking, we certainly could hire a valet service to hustle down to the Wegmans fourth story parking lot. Um, we haven't made those arrangements yet, but I am definitely open to, uh, to doing that. Our general understanding or our general knowledge experience, base experience, yeah. sorry, is that in city weddings, the average person who drives there's maybe like one or two versus like a Long Island wedding or a, you know, a suburb wedding where everybody drives. Most people choose a city wedding because no one has to drive. Okay, well, thank you. Um, were there any other committee members who had questions? I, I sorry, I, I just had one question. For sorry, Ms. Anadu. I'm oh, sorry, I, I can't ever seem to find oh, you. No. I was doing an up and down thing with my hand. Um, thank you so much, Andrew and Elizabeth, for your answers so far. As a follow-up to um, a question that was put in the chat that you answered around your employment um, and people of color, what what of those people of color fall into your management? I'm that, so and glad that you asked that question. Um, our um, management team, we have a management team of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people currently. All of those people are people of color and most of them are women of color actually, except one who is a white woman. Thank you very much. You're welcome very much. Were there any other committee members who had questions? All right. Brandon, if I may, I have one more. Sure. Um, just curious, I, I, I suspect many of the concerns will be around um, traffic in and out of the event, not only parking. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have a plan for that, how to keep traffic moving, foot traffic moving uh, smoothly in another space, you know, or if it's one of these um, spaces it's difficult to access. And so there'll be crowds outside or coming out in anyway so that, that's one so we so we will have um a staff member actually escorting guests both for hospitality reasons and for community reasons up and down the elevator so a staff member will greet guests as they arrive to the space take them up in the elevator bring them down and then escort them as they leave we'll have staff to andrew's point our staff are very involved with our events currently and that will only continue so they'll be very present and we have staff present until long after guests are gone. Um, we also plan on using Front Street versus, you know, that's where their front door is versus Hudson, which is a little bit bigger. Um, and so ideally people would be going up and down front. And that obviously also is the walkway to get to the subway. Thanks. Were there any other committee members who had questions for the applicants? I have um, a, a quick Ms. Thurston, sure. Just a, a, one more in anticipation um, and to cut off questions around this one. Um, what will you do to engage with the community um, and to make sure that if there are concerns, you they are heard and responded to? And as a suggestion, um, we sometimes encourage applicants in similar situations to host a community meeting and to do so periodically. So would love to hear if you have any plans around community continued engagement and responsiveness. Yeah, I mean, I'm totally open to even, you know, obviously we have an event space. We can host a community meeting anytime anybody wants, except for most Saturdays, for sure. And then secondly, my personal cell phone and obviously the emails of all my team would be available to anybody who would like them. And currently in all the communities that we operate in, we respond to all those within 12 hours. Like unless we're sleeping, it's the only time we would not respond in the middle of the night. I, I just wanna to reiterate too, we've been running spaces with liquor licenses in residential neighborhoods for you know over two decades. Um, some of them very residential in older neighborhoods, parts yeah. of Greenpoint that are very close to the water that have similar acoustics. Um, Fort and Green is, is, and uh, Fort Green is a, you know, our, our space in Romans and Fort Green is in a landmark neighborhood and a landmark building. So we care 
really deeply about these issues and have had very good and strong relationships with the communities that we reside in for long periods of time. So are hopeful that the same track record will continue in this space. Great. Any other questions from members of the committee? Um, so I have a couple of others. Um, first of all, I saw there was a reference to a DJ in the um, in the application. And uh, one thing I know about DJs is that they are loud. Um, what kind of uh, soundproofing or, or what have you will be in in place at the establishment to ensure that people will not be able to hear the DJ outside of the, the venue. I just want to, I um, the DJ is like a, a wedding DJ, not like a club DJ. It's just some, it's like an MC sort of for people who use them during their reception. Not everybody does. Um, but we don't have events where there's like a DJ featured for people to come listen to the DJ. It's mostly just someone who's there providing music for dancing. Um, I don't think it's possible to add sound soundproofing to the space. Yeah, because currently the space is set up, it's all glass looking out at that patio. So the only soundproofing we really could put would be the ceiling, but that's also the roof of the building. Um, so I don't know where, I mean, I think like Liz said, I don't know where the soundproofing really would go. Okay. But again, the DJ is definitely for dancing and for weddings, not for a club. Okay. Well, I, I think my other question is, uh, I, first of all, I, I think I, I'm not really sure about the status of these signatures that have been provided. And I apologies if I missed something, but were the signatures provided to the board office? Uh, yes, they were submitted with our packet. Okay. And Taya, do we have a copy of these somewhere? I am, I'm checking just now, and I can confirm that there are addresses affixed to each of the petition signatures, and they are all within, I'd say about 80% within a few blocks of this location. Okay. Great. Next question. Um, one thing I know about weddings is that people get drunk there. And mm -hmm. what would be the plan to ensure, because again, this is a residential community and what what's the plan to ensure that we don't have a bunch of drunk people wandering all over a residential community, trying to find their way to a train, knowing that the establishment is not next to the train station, um, what exactly is the plan that would exa exist for that? Because that's a concern that's been raised in the past in this community. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you. I mean, for sure, we would we would expect that the people who work for us outside are guiding these people to the right location. I think also there's a lot of back and forth between us and the wedding planner and us between the bride and groom or between the people getting their anniversary or bar mitzvah. So there's, again, a lot of information that goes back and forth where we really talk about what the expectations are for our event. Because if we allow people just to walk in and think that it's a booze party, we end up not doing a good job even for ourselves, let alone for this community. So we have a ton, a ton. I mean, the conversations for getting married, you know, these are very expensive events and the price point is pretty high. This is not a cheap open bar. They end up, they're spending a lot of money, right? This is not... So there's tons and tons and tons and tons of back and forth on how to, you know, to properly prepare and what's going to happen and the cars. A lot of times there's a bus waiting for outside to take them to their, wherever they're going to go next. Um, the, only, the other thing I would say about our clients in general, our events clients, is they tend to be slightly older and more established. And the reason that they're hiring us, you know, to Andrew's point, we are a more expensive caterer in the city. And the reason that they're hiring us is often because they want more of a sit down dinner type event where the focus is mainly on the food. These are not like 
um, hors d'oeuvres and let's get really drunk kind of events. That's just not our style in any of our businesses. Um, so people generally don't, who want those kinds of events don't seek us out because we're not a good fit in many ways for that kind of style of service. Right. It's, it's past canopies, it's stations, then it's apps, then it's entrees, then it's desserts, right? Like we are constantly, and then obviously we will have people up and down making sure people are leaving correctly. Okay. And what, what kind of security will be there? How many security people and I mean, clearly we don't, we don't have any security. We don't ever need them, but obviously if there was an issue, we have done some events for um, Hollywood type of people who would like some security outside, but generally we don't, you know, our own staff acts as, you know, I mean, I don't want to say it's security, but act as like a, a guide for everybody. We haven't really had need like to just try to reiterate my point again. We haven't ever really had need for security in that way because the events aren't geared towards this kind of like louder, get drunk wedding. These are like high end dinner parties where alcohol is being served and maybe there's like an hour of dancing and at the also, end. There's also a good amount of elderly people. People's yeah. families are here. This <laughs> right. is like there are 80 year olds in the room. Right. Like they don't even want they want to, they don't want the volume. A lot, this of our, is not... a lot of our clients are like getting married at City Hall and then having a really nice sit down dinner with family and friends. It's not like a, it's just a very different kind of, and they're small, right? I mean, this is like 80 to 100 and 125 people. These aren't like big blowout type of weddings. Okay. Oh, I'm also gonna, for I'm people gonna, asking questions in the chat, I was really good at keeping up for it. Uh, uh, Murray, if we could just hold on for a second here, Sorry. I'm gonna try to get each of the folks who raised their hand the opportunity to speak and we can address them in that order. So I'm going to scroll over to my left, and I see that Mr. Gilbert has been waiting, and just ask everybody try to keep their question to two minutes. But Mr. Gilbert, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, I want to express my extreme objection against this whole project. We have frequently been subject to noise coming from the Dougal Greenhouse. And I can assure you that whether the noise source is from inside or outside, it carries, particularly at the low frequencies. And we've been subjected to many sleepless nights from these sources. And this one is actually facing my bedroom a couple of hundred feet away. I don't know who it is who signed your petition in support, but certainly I and all my neighbors are really worried about this whole project. And we think that the, the noise concerns are not likely to be abated, no matter how many 80 year olds you're claiming are the ones who are going to be attending your events. You have, we have no control over who's attending and to put the responsibility for complaining every time we, the, the noise excess goes over a certain level on our shoulders is unfair. And we've all already had to do this. And I can assure you that when we lodge a complaint, the, the police don't come for several hours later until we already have lost a full night's sleep. So I don't think the noise concerns can be possibly abated by something that is so close. And as Mr. Porcio said, the roads are extremely narrow here. You, the Hudson Avenue, which is right across the street from your, your venue is only very narrow. And we, the, the other concern is one of traffic. And we can't imagine that with the deliveries and pickups that go on, both before, well before the, the beginning of events, during the events and after will not block the roads. And we have always seen uh, car services idling and blocking our ability to access our own homes. So I don't think that the concerns that we have are at all abated by your attempt to say that you were gonna have uh, people guarding the outside of the building. In addition, other event spaces in the neighborhood have had serious problems with noise, people vomiting on the street, and with, the, with, with, with illegal parking and with revelers on the street. And I, don't, I cannot believe that you will be able to clear the roads of all the excess trash, the revelers, and all that you claim you'll be able to prevent us. I don't want to have to be calling you every night. This is Mr. this is. Gilbert, you're at time. If you don't mind wrapping up soon, thank excuse you. Excuse me. You're okay. over time. I'll just finish. I I just feel that it's extremely concerning.
that this is going to be events that will be happening with such frequency and we won't be able to control the noise and the traffic and the pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Um, Ms. Weber is, is next. Hi, yes, um, I agree with uh, Mr. Gilbert and I appreciate everything that you have said. Uh, as well as the committee members questions. Uh, my husband and I are the supers at 312 Water Street, an eight unit building. And I also have a studio across the street from this location on Hudson. We live here because of the peace and quiet away from the crowds in Dumbo. I want to believe all these things you're saying about community outreach. And the bottom line is that noise generated from event spaces will absolutely affect the quality of our lives and the lives of our tenants. Indoor music inevitably spills out into outdoor music as people gather on terraces and go in and out of the venue. We've all been to weddings. You can say that you're different, but we all know what happens in event spaces. Noise from loudspeakers reverberates and can be felt in our Civil War era buildings. We've experienced this from parties as far away as the Navy Yard. People who drink too much will be getting sick late at night on our sidewalks and drunken yelling and belligerence is par for the course with large parties, high end or not. There will be an influx of cars, buses, idling taxis and rideshare services, honkings as guests arrive and will need to leave. Our historic streets are narrow and to begin with, there is no parking at all. Events generate large amounts of garbage and will continue to be an issue. More trucks in the area for catering supplies and deliveries will be part of the problem too. And we already have an issue with delivery trucks on our sidewalks. You'll just be adding more trucks. All of these issues will be inescapable should a license be granted to this location. This will absolutely change the lives of those of us who choose to live here to escape all that I've listed above. Vinegar Hill is a special, unique place. We very much hope to keep it that way. Please vote against this application. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Mr. Mulcahy. Uh, hi, I wanted to thank the members of uh, Community Board 2 for giving us a chance to express our concerns. I wanted to thank um, Andrew and Elizabeth for their presentation earlier. Uh, certainly a, a lot of transparency. Um, uh, now, I, I don't know that any of us um, had heard any of this beforehand. Um, and I just want to speak as somebody who lives directly across uh, from 26 Bridge Street, uh, which is another event space. I can remember back to the time when the owners of that event space who have their offices in the neighborhood sat down and met with all of us uh, in a community board meeting, and they promised every single thing that you guys are promising. We're different. We're not the same. We're high end. We do religious weddings. People don't get drunk. And, on, and, on, and traffic will be fine. We'll have a valet service. We'll tell people not to honk. We'll tell people to be courteous of the neighborhood. I have the cell phone number for um, the person who's uh, essentially the COO of the company that owns that space. I have the cell phone number for the person who is the site manager for that space. I am regularly woken up by any number of different um, sort of noise events. I've seen people urinate on our building. I've seen people vomit on the street. Um, taxi cabs don't care about your rules. They don't care about the kind of business that you run. I fully appreciate and respect um, how successful you maybe have run spaces in the past in other places, but shoehorning something like this into this kind of a space with a building that you've just said has absolutely no insulation is not a good idea. The streets and the traffic patterns cannot support it. All you need is one taxi honking at midnight to wake up me and my kids. I know because it's happened to me hundreds of times since this event space at 26 Bridge has come in. 30, um, 311 no longer responds to our complaints. The site manager minimizes every time we do it. And the problems uh, have been laid out pretty well by the, the previous two commenters. So I just want to underscore everything that they've said. And I have seen every single bit of it. I've lived in this neighborhood for 10 years. It is the worst headache you can possibly imagine. We came here for the quiet. We came here to get away. We did not come here to get inundated by venues like this. We have at least three already. We really don't need more. Respectful to people who are operating what sounds like successful businesses. It actually sounds like you really have your hands full with nine other businesses. I just don't see how you can stop all these problems that are far outside of your control with people getting drunk, with taxi drivers, with delivery drivers, with garbage, with Thank any you, number Mr. of yeah, thank you're, you. you're at time, Mr. Mulcahy. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Ms. Vachunas, it's nice to see you again. Um, and uh, you're welcome to make your comment at this at this point. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Nice to see you again. Also, Happy New Year. I have a couple of questions. 
uh, regarding several issues. You say that you have several restaurants. Do you have any other event spaces in reg residential areas in Brooklyn? That's number one. Number two, your signatures, in the beginning you said you collected it within a two block radius. Now you say you've collected it within a couple of blocks. Well, those couple of blocks could also include Dumbo. Number three, um, I respect the fact that you would like a venue like this here, but we are primarily residential now. We are no longer considered industrial. I don't see anything that you have said that would convey feelings that you would be helping the community in doing what you say you're going to do. It's going to be quiet. You're going to have people uh, tell guests where they need to go. We've had this before. We've had promises made like this before also, and it hasn't worked. Also, do you realize that we are under major construction between Con Edison and the Water Street main construction? Our streets are being torn up, which also leads to traffic haphazards. There are street closures every day. And if I believe correctly, your times are from 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. If that's the case, then you're going to be open all day. This is not just an evening venue. There's also a charter school in the same building that you want your venue space to be. And there's a public school right across the street. I, I don't understand why you think that this neighborhood would be conducive to what you want to do here. Your restaurants are primarily in residential areas, but I know of no other venue space other than the one you had in Red Hook. Can you explain that to me? Ms. Vajunas, one, thank you for your comment. But two, um, we, I, I will give the applicants an opportunity to respond once we're done with all of the, of the, uh, the comments. But I wanna ask you, um, to what extent do you believe the applicants have, uh, have reached out to the Vinegar Hill Association? They I'm have sure not, you you they would have, know the answer to that question. They have not reached out to us. I have received a text message from a neighbor that used to live here, who I believe lives in Los Angeles now, saying that he knows Mr. Tarlo and would be happy to introduce us. But that came to me last night, a little bit too late. Even though he saw our thread on our association listserv, he no nobody has ever contacted us. Look, Mr. Smith, okay. you can thank Google me and you can get my information to contact me. They can. Thank you, Ms. Vichunas. I appreciate your comments and thank you for answering my question. Ms. Hirsch, you're up next. Thank you, Chairman Smith and the members of the committee for allowing us this opportunity and for your great questions. Um, I echo everything that's been said so far. I'm not gonna repeat it. I did have a couple of comments I wanted to make on what the presentation, on the presentation that was made. The, pre the presenter said there were no other venues in the area. There were at least four venues within five blocks that do weddings and other events. So I, you know, obviously they don't know the neighborhood that well. They said they had venues in Fort Greene and Red Hook. Both of those areas have large commercial streets. We don't in Vinegar Hill. This is strictly residential. So I don't know where their place was in Red Hook. I don't know where their place was in Fort Greene, but very, it could very well have been on one of those commercial boulevards. Uh, they said they lost their lease in Red Hook. I'm just wondering why, what happened, what the neighborhood in Red Hook felt about what they were doing. As far as the music being indoors, the doors are gonna be open and shut all night on that patio, especially in the spring and the summer. So six months out of the year, that music is gonna flow into the neighborhood. And of course we have people all the time. It's very nice they're gonna escort people out of the building. They're not escorting them down my block, which is the next block over, which is completely residential. And you would need to do that onto the F to get to the F train. They did not reach out to this community at all. They had one little sign wrapped around a pole that you could hardly read. They had young people coming and saying, will you sign a petition? That's not reaching out. I, if that's their idea of being embedded in the neighborhood, I'm really not, I'm really very concerned about that interpretation of what embedded 
and, and working with the neighborhood means. So for all those reasons, I would urge this committee not to recommend a license. Thank you, Ms. Hirsch. And you were remarkably precise with the two minutes. Um, I will answer one of your questions because the applicant has already, they stated that they lost their lease because the lease was a sublease from a previous tenant. And unfortunately the landlord wanted the space back. Um, I'll let them respond at the end of the questions from everyone else. Juan from Bridge Plaza, you are up next. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I do not live next door to or in Vinegar Hill, but I do live in the neighborhood adjacent to it. And I just wanted to comment and remind the, the committee who's been very helpful with us that the problem that we have had with the allocation, which coincidentally we'll hear from soon, is very, very similar. They have outdoor space and there were promises of no, uh, you know, uh, music outside, but as somebody commented, the doors get open. Uh, we had a new ownership that took over and they came before this committee. We came, we had a problem. So the concern to me for th that neighborhood is that the outdoor space, uh, it's like a band shell and everything projects, not just the music, because the, the owners said, we're not gonna have any music outside, but they had all the doors open. So the music projected and it was a problem as, uh, most of the committee will remember, and we thank you for your support. And so that's just a comment, and I'll speak for the other application later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wan. Next up, Mr. Bartow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith, and thank you, uh, CB2, for allowing us to speak. Um, I agree with everything that's been said so far by the community members. Um, I just want to... Uh, reiterate a few points, you know, with the noise, uh, you know, it seems to me one third of the whole event space is outdoors. Um, yes, the music's going to, I don't know if the terrace doors are open during events, people are certainly going to be coming in and out. Um, and it's not just music, it's, you know, if there's a party, what I think Andrew said he would try to book it out as much as possible each night of the year. Um, party chatter is just as loud as music. If you have 150 people, which sounds like seated i don't know what the capacity is for standing or otherwise but that's a lot of people in a 3200 square foot outdoor space chatting laughing screaming yelling whatever else comes up at a wedding um respect to romans uh marlo and son's diner those are on commercial strips uh broadway in williamsburg dekalb and fort green surrounded by other restaurants and businesses that's absolutely not what's going on here we do have Vinegar Hill House down the street. We do have Cappage Aton. Frankly, I advocated for uh, licenses for both those establishments. For one, they reached out to the neighborhood uh, and sought our you know, advice and stuff prior to liquor licenses. Um, two, they offer a benefit to the neighborhood. I don't hear any benefit that this is going to offer to Vinegar Hill unless we want to go and host private events. There's no public facing element to it. I just don't see the benefit there. Um, Andrew cited buses and party buses coming and dropping people off. I have no idea where those would be staged. You know, Front Street's one way. Uh, as Mr. Gilbert said, Hudson is extremely narrow, two-way street. Um, and, you know, in short, just want to reiterate what everybody else has said. And frankly, I'm a little disappointed that there was an outreach to the Vinegar Hill Neighborhood Association. And I believe we emailed their info um, at Tarlow events and never heard back. Thank you, Mr. Bartow. Um, uh, the next person is entitled Ira Wolf Tutan's iPhone. Uh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I uh, don't zoom a lot. I apologize. Uh, thank you to the board for everybody having this. Uh, I a lot of things have been said, uh, try not to repeat them. I uh, also am firm opposition. I live at the further end of uh, the neighborhood and something I wanna reiterate a couple things is the tra traffic. I know the applicants keep saying 80 to 150 people. That's a small, that's a small wedding or a small whatever, but 80 to 150 people coming to our neighborhood as they said, as frequently as possible, all in, 
livery cars or party party buses on those two streets, which are the two main arteries in and out of our neighborhood, will close our neighborhood down. And will because one of them's a one-way street. There's no outlet on the other side of the neighborhood. So that is, I don't understand how that could ever be tenable. Um, and just also to reiterate that uh, the open terrace, which obviously music will go, the doors are gonna be open, but the open terrace also faces uh, my son's elementary school. The playground is right across the street. So, you know, 7 a.m. to 12 a.m., whatever the DJs are playing, I get, I've been to wedding DJ. I mean, it's a party. Uh, and the other concern is, I know that you say you wanna be in this neighborhood 10 years down the road. I've been here for 15 years already. This is a multi-generational community. What happens in 20 years when there's a liquor license there and it is just a nightclub. This is a concern for now for this business, for the lack of outreach to our community and also for the future of any business that will be there and how it will affect this community and the people and the families that live here. Um, and with whatever time left, my name is Celia Ellenberg. You can hear our children in the background. Apologies for that. Um, I, I'm Ira's wife. Um, you know, I, Mr. Tarlow, have been a, a patron of your restaurants for my entire life living in New York. Um, and I know you keep bringing up uh, Romans, which is a favorite. You live in Fort Greene. Um, Romans, I don't know what the capacity is, but it is not 150 people. Um, if you live next door to a venue like this with your children, would you want that in your neighborhood? I can't imagine that you would. Um, just wanted to flag that the businesses that you keep bringing up are not party spaces. They are restaurants and they might be in residential neighborhoods, but they are significantly smaller in capacity. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Razor, you're up next. Hi everybody, thanks so much for um, having us on this call and I really appreciate um, everybody being so transparent and open to having this conversation, oops. Sorry, just let me just get my notes really quick. Um, first off, I mean, I noticed um, when we were initially talking, you know, again, I support every, what everybody's saying from the neighborhood that we um, we completely oppose this proposition of having this event space in our neighborhood. Um, I think first and foremost, like as a resident, you know, and a property owner and a landlord of a historic building that's just around the corner from 295 Front, it was, I think we were all just surprised, my tenants, my extended family, and as you hear the neighborhood that, you know, this was something that was coming up and nobody in the neighborhood knew about it. And we've got such a small community here and, and type, a super tight knit community that we only found out about it by word of mouth, really from the whole group. While we were on the call, I actually reached out to my tenants to ask them potentially if they had signed anything um, that they potentially, you know, cause I was sort of shocked when they said they had 70 sig signatures. When they said it was for a few blocks away, I thought, oh, they must've gone to Dumbo because I've quite frankly surprised that they could even get five signatures in the neighborhood. My tenant did respond in the text and say, hey, yes, I did sign something, but I was told that it was something for the community, a small restaurant, you know, something that, you know, could enhance the neighborhood. But I think we've all heard that this isn't necessarily something that would enhance our neighborhood. So I do feel like, you know, if we could see those signatures and where they live, I think, and having that transparency would be helpful simply because like, maybe it sounds like they were maybe potentially misrepresenting themselves. Um, at least according to the tenant that just texted back to me. Um, I think that, you know, there was a mention of like the, you know, if there's business, other businesses in the neighborhood, and as everyone's mentioned, there's a small number of businesses in the neighborhood. I would encourage anybody from the community to, or the, com the community board to come in, the committee board to come in to our neighborhood and walk around and see how small our neighborhood is. If you've never been here before, I mean, it's a teeny tiny area, slice of heaven, super small. And you can barely hear a pin drop at nighttime. And I think that, you know, the only time we're really hearing noise around here is from, there is a lot of construction from buildings that are going up for um, residents, but nothing to the degree of how big this space will be in, in general. And I think I know, Andrew, okay, you're at the, you know, you're you were, the two minutes, Ms. Razor. Okay, uh, that's it. But I think that my point gets across, but thank you thank again. You. All right, um, Ms. Young, you're up next. Hi. Um, I, with the pin drop thing, I was laughing. I don't know if anybody saw me cause I'm like, but you can hear a pin drop on these streets. Um, and that's how quiet it is. And that's why we love it. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. I live across the street at 85 Hudson. We are five floors. You guys are seven. I 
I mean, quite frankly, I'm freaking out about how much sound is going to come from um, your roof. Uh, someone mentioned dual greenhouse. I can hear that from my bedroom. It's in the back. Uh, the cars that come to dual greenhouse when they throw like their parties, which is sound inside, all their cars get backed up to Hudson. Um, right outside my window there from time to time, and it's quite comedic, there is a truck, like a huge, a massive freight, like delivery truck that will get stuck on that street and spends anywhere from like half an hour to two hours backing up off that street. Um, everyone's mentioned uh, traffic and all that. And as everyone has said, I echo all that that is, but being a resident right across the street, um, yeah, I mean, we hear we are everything. I mean, even if it's just someone like trying to, you know, parallel park again on the street or getting their groceries out or accidentally breaking a bottle, like everything resonates on that street. Like we've got, even, even when I think it was like third, fourth floor bond collective had their lights on all night. Like that was, that was disruptive. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, all the more success to you, but please somewhere else. And um, thanks everyone for having this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Young. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to hear from the folks who have their hands up now, Ms. Um, Massengill, Ms., uh, the person entitled Buck Smith, and the person entitled Ali G. And then we will have a brief response from the applicants, and then the committee will discuss. Um, Mr. Massengill, uh, I, I um, mainly have a question uh, about the size capacity of the space, if I'm not mistaken, from what I have, your existing space in Red Hook is 1,500 square feet uh, with the capacity for 125. Is that correct? So this space is 8,300 square feet, and you're saying it has a capacity of what? Mr. Massigo, there there's not a process of Q&A oh, okay. back and forth. Sorry. With the well, my, okay, I'll, so, I'll but phrase you can it feel differently. Free to, I'll give you some. Uh, I'll give you a few extra seconds. If you yes. Go ahead. So uh, my my point was to make that it it seems really, uh, especially if the point here is to make profit as any business would. I can't imagine this this venue, which is significantly larger um, than their existing venue, to only hold the same amount of people. I can imagine that this space will end up holding hundreds more, if possible. Uh, I don't know where that would cap out, but you know the, the number they've given us seems incredibly low. Um, aside from that, I'd like to echo the sentiments of everybody else. I also live right across the street. Um, knowing that any event space, if it has doors, they're going to be open. People are going to be walking out on the patio, especially with the nice views. And whatever music you have, whether it's, whether it's a, a wedding DJ or a live band or anything, uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's a, a DJ bringing in people for a club or if it's a wedding DJ, the music's all the same. Uh, not not the music's all the same, but the sound, the, the noise levels are going to be the same. And that's going to reverberate around this very small uh, residential block, as everybody else said. That's my main concern. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Massigal. Uh, um, the person entitled Bucksmith. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Karen Smith, and um, I live across Hudson Avenue from the proposed space. Thanks for the presentations. I just want to add, everyone's spoken so eloquently that I don't actually have much to add, but I want to add my family's vehement opposition to this plan. Um, as everyone has said, it's a small neighborhood. It's a quiet neighborhood, except when Dougal Greenhouse has their all night raves, which even though they're much further away than this space, keep all of us up all night. Um, I just can't even see how it's conceivable that this could be an operating concern, given the traffic, given what everyone said about how the streets back up, just generally without, without this kind of a, a new endeavor going on. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, now, the, Mr. Ali G, please feel free to go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Ali Grebe. I live on Plymouth Street. Um, and yeah, I'm just uh, really appreciate your guys' restaurants and have enjoyed them for a long time. But I've lived here for eight years and it really is like a quiet and and special. And uh, to the to the pin drop thing, like it, that that's true. I mean, I hear I can hear, you know, my bedroom windows open. I can hear my neighbors baby crying across the backyard it's really you know and like we've 
I have small barbecues for a few friends and we wrap up by 11 o'clock on weekends and 10 o'clock on weekdays being outside in the backyard. It's like the, the sound is car carries. It's real. Everything's really quiet. And I just did want to add that we have the Vinegar Hill House and Cafe Gitan. I was Vinegar Hill House uh, predated me here, but I did support Cafe Gitan's liquor license. So we're not opposed to giving liquor licenses in our, in our neighborhoods. But as Barto said, it is like, or we, you know, the, those places bring a benefit to our community and just it's a completely different, different scale. It's a, it's a people measured, the amounts of people that can get in there are measured by the dozens. You know, the Cafe Gitan is like 10 tables. And even though I do love those places and I go to them both all the time, you know, anytime an Uber comes to drop somebody off or pick somebody up at those locations, it does completely shut down the neighborhood. It completely blocks everything. And I just can't imagine what it would be like to let out, you know, even if like, uh, it's just like a half of the guests of the wedding leaving at the very end or a quarter of them, just the Ubers is going to be completely shut down the neighborhood. Um, anytime there's an event, people arriving, people leaving. And uh, so I am very concerned about that. And that's that's it. I think uh, my my neighbors have already said everything that I would otherwise say, and I'm uh, united with them in opposition to this. And I hope the community board recommends to the liquor authority to uh, reject your application. But thank you for coming and speaking to us. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ali G. Um, I'm going to go back to the applicants because we've heard a number of different points here, but I, I don't want this to become uh, even more elongated than it, it already is, but you've heard comments from a number of neighbors about uh, noise concerns, about folks spilling out in the neighborhood, about the, um, the soundproofing, and about lack of outreach. And I would ask you all and I'll give you three minutes because it's a lot of different comments to respond to the the, the neighbors' uh, concerns that they have provided. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. Um, first of all, I want to thank every single person who just shared their feedback with us. Uh, this process is incredibly valuable for us too to just start to learn about what the concerns are so we can address them now and in the future. Um, our, we actually wanted our staff to the people who would be working in that space all the time to be the ones meeting with you. Some of them are a little young, but certainly I don't think any of them would, would have misrepresented or have any confusion about what kind of space we we're trying to operate. These are all people who are very engaged with, uh, and invested in, in running and operating the our current company. So they know very well what we're doing. Um, so I'm sorry if there was any confusion, but I certainly would like to stand behind our staff and believe that they were representing what we're doing ac accurately. Um, I want to address so one thing about the building. I said, I don't know if there was a way to ins like add insulation. I did not say that the building is not insulated. I don't, I, I don't have that information to the degree that I would need to. I think in order to really answer that question, I don't have an accurate measure of how much insulation is in the building. Um, I want to address really quickly again the 26 Bridge Street and Dougal Greenhouse. Dougal Greenhouse is a massive event venue. It's, I mean, I think thousands of people could fit in that space. What we're doing is just not anywhere remotely close to that kind of venue space. And 26 Bridge Street is a space that anyone could rent out. We could go rent it out. You could go rent it out. The people who are in and out of that space are different all the time, different vendors, different caterers, um, different planners. We would have the same planners, obviously the same cater caterers, planners, staff, operations people, the same, you know, they're all the time. Um, it's just an incredibly different way to operate a business. And we operate the businesses the way that we do because we want to be a part of this community. Um, we really hope that this is the beginning of a process of being neighbors. I recognize that we got off on the wrong foot. Um, and I deeply apologize for that and take accountability for that and hope that we have an opportunity moving forward to change our relationship. Um, oh, just to address the lease issue in Red Hook really quickly. Um, 
just to confirm, it was a sublease from another tenant uh, and the landlord wanted the space back. It wasn't anything to do with there being issues or noise, et cetera. It was just a like regular kind of lease issue. Um, oh, and also we, everyone talked about Marlon Sons and Diner and Romans a lot, which of course are very special and we love them. But also we do actually operate uh, a bar and restaurant. It's predominantly a bar in a very residential neighborhood in Greenpoint. Um, it's, very it's very quiet, very residential space and have not had issues there. We've, you know, any little things that have come up, we've been able to solve. Um, so just wanted to say that we do, we do operate a business in a very residential space. Um, that's not dissimilar, like cobblestone streets, very, you know, not totally dissimilar to Vinegar Hill. Um, and I think I'm sure my time's up. Yeah. So, you're a little bit over, but sorry, I appreciate, thank you, you, so much. I appreciate you, you addressing as, Mr. Smith, at, at, do you mind if I, there was a question about the sorry. Of role. Do you mind if I answer that question really quickly? Sure, if you, if you can briefly answer yeah. that question. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, of Mr. course. There, there was a question about whether or not the measurement was, you know, within 200 feet or had been taken. Uh, we did have a professional company come out and take measurements for us. And we have, uh, we, we have confirmed that the space is more than 200 feet away. So it would not be an issue with the school. Um, and then additional to that, um, this, this space well, is also I, I thought that you said that was what you were gonna address was the 200 foot. And oh, I appreciate I was, that. Yeah. And I just wanna arbit put this out of the question at, the, at this point, which is community board is not the arbiter of the 200 foot rule. That's the state liquor authority. So we appreciate that you're in, that you say you're in compliance, but we're not here to to judge whether you're in compliance with the 200 foot rule. We're we're here to to make a decision as the community board. And I appreciate the feedback though, and that was a helpful comment. So thank you. At this point, having heard from numerous committee community members and from the applicants, I'm going to ask the committee if there's anyone who would like to make a motion. Ms. Thurston, I see you. Thank you, Mr. Um, uh, so uh, I'd like to make a motion for community members very quickly. I'll add the context that unfortunately or fortunately, it is in the community's interest for us to make motions um, that are very, very specific rather than necessarily voting no. And that is simply because of the way that the SLA operates. So it's to Taya's earlier point in the chat, we like to provide specific, very specific conditions where appropriate. And so that's what you're about to hear me do. So I will make a motion to approve the application with the following conditions. No outdoor hours Sunday through Thursday. And I have this written down in the minutes too <laughs> for folks. Um, outdoor space must close at 9 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. When the outdoor space is closed, all doors must remain closed. I hear people that that might not keep sound in, but that's what I'm saying for now. Um, additionally, two more. The applicant must have security personnel during all hours of operation outside the primary entrance on the street. And the applicant must host a meeting in partnership with the Vinegar Hill Association with the community before opening. And all of these conditions are because I am personally opposed to this application. The applicants clearly misrepresented their engagement with the Vinegar Hill Association and don't have a plan for managing um, security or intoxicated patrons outdoors. I don't see this benefiting the neighborhood. That is my motion. Uh, now, for our procedure, a motion being made, is there a second for the motion? Member of the committee, want to second the motion? I second the motion. Ms. Anadu, second the motion. Um, all right, discussion on the motion. Now, the discussion is limited to committee members only. So whether you're the applicants or anyone else here at the meeting, it's just the the committee members or the board office staff. Um, so the motion's been laid before us. And I want to be clear so that we all understand what we're, we're looking at here. This will be an application that will be from 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. indoors, seven days a week. Um, it would be um, private events that entire time. The music would consist of live acoustic music, 
live amplified music or a live DJ as the applicants described. The outdoor seating is uh, um, the outdoor area as we've proposed would be closed Sunday through Thursday and open until nine on Friday and Saturday. Um, we would require that there be security personnel that would be provided by the applicants whenever they are open and a meeting with the community before they are open and that the doors be closed during any um, events that are going on. Um, now, first I'll ask Ms. Thurston, did I get all of that? Um, uh, did you say the host a meeting, community meeting? Please? Yes, I got the, okay, yes. I got, right, I, yep. I got, I, I got the community meeting. That's all I've said so far, an open to okay. yes. Now I like to, I, I'd like to ask the committee um, whether there's any feedback on the, the, um, the motion or any um, thoughts or perspectives to share on the motion that Ms. Thurston has raised. I have. Um, um, or, oh, sorry. Um, I'll put my hand up. I, I don't know which one happened first. So I'm going to go to Ms. Einhorn and then I'll go to Ms. McKnight. Is that OK, Ms. McKnight? It's OK, Ms. McKnight. That is fine. Please. That is fine. Please, please. Go ahead, Lindsay. Um, so at, at this point, I'm definitely against against this motion, but I, I do want to ask if we think that maybe it behooves us to ask them to have the community meeting before we vote and try to get some community consensus on some limitations to the to the serving to try to get the community onboarded to the project, um, because that might go better for them tonight. So Ms. Einhorn, could you just, I guess, clarify a little bit? Do you feel you 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 feel like they should have more hours or or what, what what's your sure your concern I, with I'm the I'm very concerned that the community seems to be against the the project in general um that they're here in force tonight and that there may have been some misrepresentation of the outreach that had been done with the community and so I'm wondering if they would like to withdraw their their license application for the moment and we could lay it over until next month and vote on it after they've had a community meeting where at that meeting they could try to talk to the community onboard them to their ideas and talk about some limitations for the license that we could then add to our motion that the community has consensus on thank you Ms. Einhorn. um and i, I want to hear from each of the from the committee members to the extent that we can Ms. McKnight, I'm sorry that I didn't recognize you earlier. Uh, please take the floor and provide whatever statement you'd like to make. Yeah, I have a similar concern as Lindsay that there is um, a lack of neighborhood support for this liquor license. But, and I do understand the concern of the residents, but my other concern that I have is that this is a commercial property. So this might be an issue, even if they don't get the liquor license that they might have to deal with in the future with that property being there. But um, I'm open to listening and considering what other people have to say on the board. Okay. Mr. Ryan? Yes, uh, good evening. Um, I. My, my question and my concern is I think this whole thing should be tabled um, regarding the opposition that the community has, the stipulations that are, are being suggested to put on the business um, before they could open. I just think it should be tabled and some areas are worked out and then let them come back at a later date. Um, to see if it's doable at all. Okay. It's just, well, uh, even, you know, I mean, listening, and, and I think that I listen very closely. I, I, you know, I have some concerns about, uh, you know, it's how the, uh, the neighborhood is um, portraying themselves. I mean, I mean, we live in Brooklyn, we, we live in the city of New York. Um, you can't have neighborhoods that are that exclusive, but, just on the stipulations that were were placed, I, I think that at this time, I would be, you know, 
amicable to having this tabled for another time. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Ryan. Um, I want to make sure that we hear from any committee members who want to speak. Um, it, were there I, any other committee members who wanted to speak at, at, at this point? Can you see me? Akosua. Oh, Akosua, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't see anybody tonight. There's 74 people on this call. So <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It could be me also. <laughs> Um, while I while I definitely am in, in support of business, so I understand the business people, but I'm also very concerned uh, about the community and their feelings uh, and their thoughts about this establishment in their community. So I recommend uh, tabling until the community can meet with the establishment owner and they come back to us and talk about it. Uh, because um, it, as I said, I, I'm very much concerned. I'm very much concerned. And I really believe there should be so much more of a discussion between the owners and the community while I, while I support business. Uh, but this is, you know, this is, this is their neighborhood and their community. So I suggest take bullying that. Okay. You know, a number of people have expressed this. At this point, I'm going to ask the, the applicants, is, is it your preference that um, you take some time, go off and have a meeting with uh, the Vinegar Hill community and come back to us? Or would you prefer that we take a vote on your motion tonight? Mr. Smith, before the applicant answers that question, we need to have them confirm what their target opening date is, please. They, they, they stated it would be towards the end of the year. Um, uh, but please clarify that first, if you like. No, that's correct. Thank you. Um, so what, what's, your, I guess, hearing where everybody is, do you, are you, do you all would you all prefer to uh, take some time and and maybe have that meeting with the community now and and come back next month or um, what's the uh, uh, or do you prefer that we make the decision on this tonight? I, I I'm not saying that we're going to do whatever you say. I I'm just I want your voice to be heard in that regard. And you're on mute. Sorry, no. sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, based on everything I've heard, I feel like we should go back to the community and talk to them and defer. Um, I don't know what the best process, you know, we can figure out the best right. process. To do this, well, but. that that was my question. I appreciate you sharing your perspective. Um, so not, no one of us can say that there is a that this is going to be tabled, what has to happen is someone on the committee must make a motion to table, and then uh, that motion is considered in the same regards that any other motion is, is made. So I see Ms. Thurston has her hand up, and I'll recognize her. And again, I just want to limit this to committee members. Well, there's a motion on the floor. So just to clarify, if someone wants to make a motion to table, it has to be presented as a friendly amendment. Um, Brandon, you know that, I'm sure I know the other community members, committee members, but I must note, if this is tabled, there is a chance we will waive our voice as a community board and therefore as a community because the applicants have given us sufficient notice according to the SLA. So committee members, please do weigh that. This may be our only chance to outline our stipulations and conditions on a vote um, tonight. If we table it, we likely lose any chance and it will be approved by the SLA with no conditions. But please, I welcome the friendly amendment. All right. Ms. Einhorn. So I, I know we've talked about that often a no, a, an outright denial um, is not the best way to communicate our wishes uh, around liquor licenses, but is there a way for us to vote no and, and give our reasoning to like add 
to no. that vote. To, okay. That is why it's worth creating conditions that are perhaps difficult, which was my attempt to do, but I welcome amendments that could make it even more difficult. Right. My, I would add an amendment about assessing for soundproofing and installing soundproofing wherever possible. Um, I reject your amendment only because it is not specific enough. Do you have a suggested way of like measuring that or stating all exterior walls, something like that, that would just- Sure, add? sure. Yeah. Um, all walls and ceilings where additional insulation and, and noise proofing is possible um, shall have them added. I accept your amendment. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, anyone else on the committee have a point or a comment to make at this point? My only comment is that though I truly understand the concerns of the residents, it's a lot of restrictions we're putting on a local business. And, and that is a concern for me. Um, let's I'll see, Ms. Anadu, I'll, I'll, I'll recognize you. And then I saw Ms. Einhorn still had her hand up, but I'll clarify that with her after you speak. Um, I'll just, um, I'm torn on this because I just, um, and this is more just a comment of what I'm struggling with on this issue. Um, I respect and understand people's desire to, to protect their neighborhoods. But then on the other hand, I feel strongly that we live in New York City and we don't live in a suburb. Um, and so for me, it is figuring out and hopefully that, you know, there, there can be some agreement that's made that doesn't make it untenable to have the business, but also somehow makes the, the residents happy. So I will just, that is it. So not a question, but just a comment. Okay. Um, any other comments from members of the committee? Ms. Einhorn, this will be the last comment. I'm sorry. I do just want to say that while I am against the way that this has happened, I do think the character of this neighborhood is changing. And us putting some limitations on the liquor license that are, to Emily's point, that are amenable to both the community and the business, I think is, is a way to find a compromise. I was just, I was hoping that we could have the community forum beforehand, but to Jessica's point, we could then be giving up the community's voice and they came here tonight to be heard. So I'm hoping maybe we can relist the time constraints and like maybe as a committee, think about making these attainable, but also stringent enough to protect some of the characteristics of the neighborhood that the, the neighbors do enjoy. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Einhorn. I mean, I, I will just say that and I see we have another hand up at the, this point, but we're, we're past the point where other folks from outside the committee can speak, so I'm sorry. Um, I just want to note in light of moving this along that having heard this discussion and frankly being now 10 years on this committee, I, I have had heard from many different businesses here in in uh, Vinegar Hill and visited the community before myself. Um, and I, I, I think on the one hand, I, am, I respect the fact that it seems that the applicants have been able to successfully manage other locations. And um, at, the, at the same time, I am concerned that there was an outreach to the Vinegar Hill Association before this, because frankly, we don't, we, we, we don't, we're not the place to have these large community meetings and effectively that's what this meeting became this evening. Um, I can't also ignore that out of our standard red flags that we have for applications, this, this application checks several of them in terms of just risks for, um, in terms of private events. DJ, um, the, uh, uh, the the soundproofing, the uh, and the uh, the fact that it's going to be offering certain kinds of uh, weddings and, and and such, but 
I and, and I honestly had half a mind that 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 I might vote against this, but frankly, hearing the conditions that Ms. Thurston provided in her motion, it literally made me feel like there that um, and I don't know if I would say I would agree exactly with these conditions, but I would say it, it made me feel that uh, more comfortable with um, with considering uh, approving this on a on a limited basis. Um, but I will say I will reserve that. That was my comment. I do want to just pose this to the applicant because while just like with the direction of the meeting, you you can't necessarily, um, we don't just do what, what you tell us. Um, but I do want to know from you whether the items that were proposed in Ms. Thurston's motion are feasible from your perspective. Um, and that would be closing the outdoor space Sunday through Thursday. Um, 9 p.m. close on Friday for the outdoor space, not Friday and Saturday. Everything remains the same indoors except you got to, well, I'm not going to, I will offer some cl clarifiers there. The, the doors have to be closed while the, the event is operating. Um, there has to be uh, soundproofing in the walls and ceiling, I believe is the uh, specific um, condition that was noted. Um, there must be security personnel out front and there must be a meeting before you, you open the location with the local community. Um, if you could just note if there's any of those items that are not feasible from your perspective, that doesn't mean that we won't recommend them, but we, we do want to understand what your perspective is on it. Um, you know, Sunday through Thursday for the outdoor you know, I think if there was a daytime meeting on a Wednesday afternoon with a bunch of corporate people from Dumbo, I don't think it is feasible that we would close the outdoor section. I think that to sell the space to a bunch of corporate executives who want to like have lunch and look at the view of the city, we would actually need the outside. Whether I close, I would maybe accept a closure at nighttime or a closure around parties. Um, you know, at 9 or 10 p.m. in some capacity. Um, in terms of security, I certainly can put a mem a staff member outside, a security person. I guess I'd like some clarification if you're talking about every event. So if we're talking about 20 executives coming to lunch, do I need a security person? Or is it only for a wedding on a Friday night or a wedding on a Saturday night? Or does a bar mitzvah not count because nobody drinks at a bar mitzvah? Like, you know, I think... It is an immense expense, so I would like some clarification on details of what you guys really want. Um, yeah, obviously, we've already agreed to. And the last one, I think we've already agreed to. So the soundproofing around the walls that are feasible, I'm totally willing to do that. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, so. Ms. Thurston, you as the maker of the motion, having heard of any the the applicant's feedback, is there there anything you'd like to change about your motion or or uh, candidly, or I want I'm hoping that my stipulations make it an undesirable location for this business. So I do not plan to change the stipulations. Okay. Were there any other members of the committee who wanted to add a a comment before we vote on the matter? So I would like to make a friendly amendment to address what um, Mr. Tar Tarlow stated. And if we can, because what he stated sounds reasonable to me with the bar mess for there won't be any alcohol. And if it's corporate meetings with businesses there and it's only 50 people or less, I don't know why we would need to have security. So, I would like to make an amendment to say for those, for certain type of, and I'm trying to think of how I can um, state it, for part, for anything other than weddings or anniversaries or what we would consider to actually be a celebration, that's when we will have security. But something like a corporate meeting, I don't think it's necessary. 
candidly, maybe I work at a debaucherous corporation, um, but some of the drunkest events I go to um, are corporate events, meetings, whatever they are, people drink heavily. So do you mind specifying, like making a very specific friendly amendment? Perhaps it is around the number of people at an event or the hours? Okay. Um, fewer than, see, my, my concern is just saying something right off the top of my head may not be um, sufficient, but if I were to, well, I am doing it now since then, if I were to, I would say 50 or fewer, fewer than 50. And, okay, so and what else am I missing? Event, what's, what are you suggesting about events with 50 or fewer people? that um, have outdoor space or that they don't need security? That they don't need security because of the expense that was mentioned, that it would be very expensive. And we didn't, I, yeah. Okay. Friendly amendment um, of no security needed for events with 50 people or under. Okay. Oh yes, and then it was also mentioned about the leaving the doors open for outdoor space during a daytime if it's, um, also, I would say fewer than 50 people or something along those lines. Until what hour? Um, daytime. I'm thinking about 6 p.m. Well, it depends, right? The sun goes down in New York earlier during this time of year. It's about five. Okay, well, seven days a week? Um, what did we bring up earlier? I thought that we said that there was no, no, no outdoor out, space. No outdoor from Sunday through Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. What did we say? Yeah. So for that, I would make an amendment that we can do it depending on the type of event. Again, with the number of people, 50 or fewer, and we leave the outdoor space, oh, allow them to have the outdoor space. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, I should note this is a level of detail that is not really within our control, but we are adding stipulations. Well, I want to address that point. The, the circumstances are effectively, we have to address, we have to address um, conditions that are effectively enforceable. Now, the community board is not the one to enforce conditions the 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 folks who enforce conditions are the state liquor authority and the mechanism is people making complaints to the state liquor authority um so as thurston what is the what is your understanding of what the 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 limits would be on what would be allowable in terms of um security that miss or Gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm losing it according I guess to what I'm just not sure we proposed. Can... Well, maybe Taya, you might know better than I do. I, I guess I just thought in the past when we provided this level of granularity, it was questionably within our purview. <laughs> so I'm not sure, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Taya, do you have a sense? Ms. Muller, do you have any sense here? I do. The committee and the board are free and encouraged to recommend whatever they feel is reasonable. However, the board does not create nor enforce law. And there are existing laws that determine issues such as security per capacity, security per attendance of persons, whether it is a temporary assembly or a permanent assembly, et cetera. So I, I would caution the committee to not go too far into the weeds, into the details. Um, that's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Muller. So I, I guess where does this where does this leave us in, in terms of your your motion, Ms. Thurston? I suggest we call the question. I'm happy to read all the Well, I, I I'm trying to figure I'm trying to understand what are we what what's the what are what are the standards of because right now what I've got, and you tell yeah. me if this is right, yeah. is Sunday through Thursday, the outdoor space is closed. Friday and Saturday, it's open until 9 p.m. 
The doors have to be closed at all times during events. There has to be security personnel stationed in front at all events. Um, there needs to be a meeting with the community before it opens, and there needs to be soundproofing of the walls and ceilings. That's that's what I have as the motion, but I, I, I don't want to miss anything else. With two um, changes from uh, Ms. McKnight, uh, no security required for events with 50 people or under. Again, questionable if we can if that's enforceable, um, as is any security stipulation made. Um, and to allow outdoor hours Sunday to Thursday until 6 p.m. for events with 50 people or fewer. I changed it to 5. 5 p.m., okay. Okay, I'm sorry, what, what were the times for the outdoor? Outdoor hours Sunday through Thursday allowed until 5 p.m. for events with 50 people or fewer, which is unfortunately not a stipulation that is possible to make in the form as is. Um, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so I understand this. And then just so everyone is aware of what the, the, the community board is considering, the motion would be to approve the application with the conditions that the outdoor space be open from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Sunday through Thursday, uh, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. Um, the doors must be closed during any events. Um, the daytime hours on the weekdays are limited to those where there are 50 people or fewer. Um, the security uh, personnel must be in front for all events except those that have 50 or fewer people. There needs to be a meeting with the community before the location opens, and there needs to be soundproofing of the walls and ceilings. Um, so that's the motion, and having heard the motion, I vote in favor. Uh, Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. McKnight, how do you vote? In favor. Uh, Ms. Einhorn, how do you vote? In favor. Mr. Ryan, how do you vote? Can't hear you, Mr. Ryan. I'm sorry, you're on mute. With reservations, in favor. Okay. Well, we don't have any qualifiers, but appreciate your vote. Um, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Cobb. <laughs> In favor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Varela, how do you vote? Against. Okay. And Ms. Anadu, how do you vote? Abstain. Okay. And Ms. Cumberbatch, how do you vote? I'm also abstaining. Okay. Did I miss anyone on the committee? I don't think so. Um, so what do we have in the way of a vote? We have- The one to uh, two. <clears throat> sorry, what, what Ms. Six Thurston, to you're the secretary, so I'm gonna trust you on what you come up with here. Yeah, six to one to two. Six to one to two, thank you very much. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you very much, everyone. We're now gonna move on to, and good luck with your establishment. Um, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda. The uh, next item on the agenda is 85 Flatbush Real Hospitality Group. Do we have someone here from that location? Yes, Mr. Smith. It's Donald Bernstein, the attorney for the applicant. Oh, hi, Mr. Bernstein. It's How nice are you? To Happy see New Year. Again. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And so with me, before I we have, uh, I have two people with me, uh, Robert Gormley and Amanda Pomeroy. Okay, great. Thank you. So before we go into this, Mr. Bernstein, I'm going to go through a bit of the history that we have with this location in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, then we'll be happy to discuss what you would like to do. So back in the days when this was known as the Dazzler Hotel, 
This came before our committee on September 2nd, 2015. Carlos Gurias and David Gibbert appeared before the committee um, and represented that there were no neighbors impacted by the outdoor space. Um, there were no community members who appeared for this meeting, either for it or against it. And the committee voted 8-0-0 to approve a liquor license for the Dazzler Hotel. Um, 2017, we started getting some complaints. Between May and September of 2017, there were 82 complaints filed with 311 due to noise from the outdoor beer garden. A letter was sent from the community board to the hotel's for, uh, attorneys. It was by that point known as the Tillery Hotel. And there was a meeting in person held in November of 2017. Vanessa Vitali and Stephen Traub attended representing Tillery Hotel and their owners, the Chetrit Group. Um, they informed us the hotel closes at 11 p.m. every night, and we heard numerous concerns from members of the community about noise, lack of a response from management. Um, we uh, had a discussion because this is all centering on this beer garden area, which directly faces the residents in this community, uh, this uh, terrace area. And it, it's like directly across the street from a bunch of residential um, establishments. Um, the applicants agreed at that point that all speakers would be removed. There would be no more amplified music outside, only acoustic music. It was agreed that they would come back at the 2018 meeting of the Hess Committee for a status update. And on that ground, we approved their renewal 501. June of 2018, uh, numerous members of the Bridge Plaza Association came to our meeting, but the Tillery Hotel did not attend or send a representative. There had been loud music, uh, there had been discussions, there was new management, there was discussion about it being a mistake. They would not use electronic music in the future. Um, and we didn't have an item to vote on at that meeting. So the item, the, the discussion was put, put over basically until we had a, a uh, uh, renewal. And in between, it seems that the, the folks associated with Isaac Hager uh, purchased the, the property from the Chetrick Group in September of 2019. And subsequently, we had Elkie Hoffman and the general manager, Aliyah Huey, appear on October 2nd, 2019, presenting an application for the transfer of the liquor license. Numerous com community members attended the meeting, not unlike tonight, and expressed similar concerns regarding music played from the second floor balcony. Um, as these were continued concerns, the, the Hess committee voted 510 to approve the transfer of the application to the Isaac Hager group, conditional on no background, DJ, live or acoustic sound on the second floor, uh, indoor or outdoor area, or otherwise amplified sound, and a 10 p.m. close for the outdoor area. The board office um, wrote a letter to the State Liquor Authority communicating the terms of the, that approval, and that was shared with the folks from uh, Hager Group. Um, in 2020, in September, because we have the pandemic and things are happening, and um, the Tillery Hotel received new complaints about music being played in, in from the second floor of the location. Um, there were corresponding issues about the financial condition of the, the hotel at the time. And Later that month, the Bridge Plaza Association recorded loud uh, soca music being played purportedly uh, from the, the, the beer garden. And we had another meeting where we brought out representatives of the establishment. This time it was somebody named Maritza Rodriguez who attended and discussed the noise concerns. Um, and basically the representation we received from Ms. Rodriguez was the hotel was just starting back after COVID-19. They had a lot of they had a lot of issues. And regardless of what we said or did, they were going to play the music anyway on the outdoor area. Um, this led our committee to vote 600 to send a letter to the SLA notifying them of the license violations occurring at uh, the Tillery Hotel. 
Um, the board office subsequently reported after this that the noise was continuing, so it doesn't seem to have solved the, the issues. And shortly after that, the hotel filed for bankruptcy. And now we're here in 2023, uh, shortly after there's been a purchase by the Ohana Real Estate Group uh, from the Isaac Hager people uh, from November of 2022, and we have a license in front of us. So with that background, and I'm sorry to take up a little bit of time at the late hour, um, Mr. Bernstein, I'll turn it over to you to ask you what we're presenting at tonight's meeting. Great. Thank you. That was actually very helpful. I had some of those prior resolutions. I didn't have quite the amount of detail that you gave. Uh, also very shocked to hear that an applicant would uh, say that not with, notwithstanding what they get approved for, they're going to play music or do something. Um, um, that's, that's kind of astounding. Uh, in any event, you, you, you're correct. Uh, Ohana Real Estate is acquiring this hotel, um, and they are engaging Real Hospitality Group and um, um, Mr. Gormley, who is on the uh, this meeting with us, is is a representative of Real Hospitality and is going to be the general manager of the hotel. Gentleman that has many years' experience managing hotels. Uh, even though uh, we're acquiring the the complete asset, the hotel, this is not an application for a hotel license. Unlike the other. Uh, the Dazzler and the Tillery under prior ownership, we're not licensing the entire hotel. This is an on-premises license application, and it is limited to the cellar level, uh, the ground floor, and the second floor mezzanine. Uh, on the cellar level, you would see from uh, the floor plans that it includes bathrooms, a kitchen, coat check, and what's labeled as meeting space, which is a darker color green, but it is part of what we are licensing. And that will be meeting space. It will be event space. If there are any private parties that you typically associate with a hotel, uh, that will be uh, principally in that meeting space, uh, which is that uh, large square on the on the right side. That That's the cellar level. Um, whatever music is down there being subgrade space, should not be heard by or disturb anybody. Um, on the ground floor is of course the entry to the hotel and the lobby space and the full service restaurant. You'll see both of those spaces uh, on that floor plan. And then the second floor mezzanine includes an indoor bar and the outdoor terrace. That is the space that we are going to license. Um, we are aware of the general history of the outdoor space. Um, we did outreach to, I think, uh, every building between 41 Duffield and 63 Duffield and give, sending them uh, notices of our application. We've um, attached to the questionnaire that you have a copy of the notice that we sent to all of those buildings. We did want to do outreach. I believe that we only heard back from one resident with respect to um, the terrace area. One thing that was apparent to me in reading your prior resolutions from 2017 and 2019 was that, uh, I guess it's Mr. Hager, uh, did not have experience operating or owning hotels. And I can't say if that accounted for the problems that the neighbors experienced or not. But what I can tell you is that Real Hospitality Group, as represented here by Mr. Gormley, um, manages or owns 90 properties, uh, of, of uh, many of which, if not all, are hotels. It's been in business for, I think, over 12 years. It manages the Orchard Street Hotel in Manhattan, uh, Four Points by Sheraton and Flushing, uh, Hotel uh, Hyatt in Nyack. Um, and in many other areas uh, in New York and outside and in other states. So they are very experienced. They know how to deal with outdoor space. They know how to deal with being in mixed commercial and residential areas. And do not think that you will have the experience that the neighbors had with the prior owners, where they either did not come to meetings or did not follow up with residents. Um, we've taken an active 
uh, active steps to reach out to the residents and speak with anybody that contacted us to discuss um, any any issues that they've had in the past with the hotel. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I missed a little information. Just wanted to add that Real Hospitality manages 39 Marriott hotels, 17 Hiltons, eight Intercontinentals, and four Hyatt. So you're talking about a very, very experienced group. The hotel, uh, as you know, is nine stories. It has um, 174 rooms, but again, we're just licensing the, the three lower floors. Um, indoors, there are 35 tables and 160 seats in the restaurant. The cellar space has a maximum occupancy um, of, I think, a little over 200. That's what could be accommodated if there were any private events. Um, the hours for the interior space will be 6 a.m. until 2 a.m. We don't anticipate the restaurant being open until 2 a.m. The 2 a.m. is required only if there is a wedding or an event that goes late at night in the basement space, but the restaurant will probably be emptied by midnight or earlier uh, every night. Uh, for the outdoor space, they would like to have the use of that until midnight. I believe that the prior resolution that you had uh, was 10 p.m. and midnight. And Mr. Smith, you made you, you said 10 p.m., but I'm looking at um, a resolution from October 2nd, 2019. And what I see in a motion made by Mr. Harrison that was approved five to one was Friday through Saturday, midnight outdoor close, Sunday through Thursday, 10 p.m. outdoor close. Um, so I just want to let you know that's where I'm getting that from. Um, uh, I just also wanted to let you know that this is, just because it's important to know, this is not a 500-foot rule application. There are not three or more licenses within 500 feet. So this is not an application that is subject to the public interest test. Uh, notwithstanding that, we're here. We want to hear what uh, what what the committee has to say. What the residents have to say and and very willing to work with the residents and the community board and coming up with uh, an operation that that is not going to create an unreasonable disturbance to the neighborhood and i think that and i can't answer for the prior owners but i can i can say for my clients that um you know they're operating a hotel and the last thing they want to do they certainly don't want to disturb any residents that live nearby and they certainly don't want to disturb guests in the hotel that have rooms right above um, this commercial space in the hotel and, and above the terrace. So we'll be operating it, keeping keeping that in mind. And that's all I wanted to say. Um, Robert, if you want to add anything. Absolutely. So, and first off, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, Community Board, too, for allowing me to speak. Uh, as Donald said, I am the general manager here at the Tillery. I'm actually here right now. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm very excited about being here. Um, I can't speak much. I do appreciate and understand as being this type of business, all the frustration and uh, what everybody had to go to uh, go through. And I've listened to that and, and I sympathize with everybody. I just think it's uh, totally inappropriate with the inability of the previous owners to operate. They quite frankly weren't qualified to operate. And I just want to say that I've been in this business for over 30 years. I have worked for Marriott Brands, I've worked for Sheridan, the W Brands, the Hyatt's, uh, so several different type of hotel brands, and very familiar with, with how these operations should work, and work in conjunction with the community, and not be a nuisance to the community, but a participant in the community, and build relationships. Uh, I would say RHG, who I work for, uh, as Donald's pointed out, we're, we're within New York, we're all over New York. We operate hotels and we're not a nuisance uh, at these in these communities. We're in communities that there's residents and we've never had problems at our other hotels. And we cultivate relationships with business partners within the communities to drive more desire and um, commerce to these community areas. You know, we have a very good relationship for starters with J.P. Morgan Chase, who runs out of uh, Metro Tech. We have great relationships with the Barclay Center, with the, um, the Navy Yard. Uh, this is our reputation. This is real hospitality's reputation. I can't speak to anything that you've experienced in the past. Those aren't us. 
We are not knife, nightlife uh, oper operators. We are the hotel industry. We are hoteliers. That's what my basis and my passion has always been. And uh, it will commit, uh, continue to uh, commit to that, to that uh, you know, promise to everybody in the neighborhood, give you an idea of what we're doing over here. We have 174 rooms for those who don't know. Uh, it's also important, I think, that we need to know, uh, to note that we have 63 residents. We are also a landlord. There are people living in this building that we will be renting to that will also have the same concerns and also have to listen to things that are going into this uh, hotel. So we will be respectful for that. As Donald said, we are, um, we are applying for a restaurant that in a space that's never been utilized. We're looking for family type. Uh, environments where the community can come in, where you can all come in, enjoy the fair, as well as bring your, your family as they travel into New York, they want to come and visit you. This is a beautiful hotel. We have a lot to offer here. And we look at all the different menus as amenities, as a different ride, as the experience, as the overall hotel. We have our lobby cafe. That's just a very nice experience, which open to the community. We'll have the uh, lobby restaurant area. And yes, we'll have the second floor um, garden deck that I'll call it, not a beer garden. If anybody can actually see into this garden area, we're actually ripped out a good amount of what was in there. And we're in the process of rearranging it. We want to create a different type of environment. As I said, we don't have any intentions of, of fielding it out to third parties who sell tickets that are promoters that will encourage people to come and drink and intoxicated. That's just not what we do here. We have a number of rooms that oversee the, um, the garden area. We want it to be a pleasant experience. And again, not a nighttime experience. And uh, I very much am involved in the community and will get involved in the public community as well as this board, as well as um, local uh, Brooklyn community events, uh, working over with Borough Hall and uh, the politicians in the community. So, as I said, and I have to reiterate that real hospitality, we're, we're different. And I, at the previous conversation, at the previous uh, community meeting, talking about the previous uh, liquor license and how everybody comes in and they make these promises, I understand promises is only good as you were. But um, I am involved. I am very much involved and would always step to the front and answer any type of questions, concerns. Uh, all we ask is that you just give us an opportunity to come in here to add into this community. I know that there's definitely concerns as it relates to noise, and we are very open minded and would like to be given the opportunity to work with the community as much as uh, we could bring in a, uh, uh, a sound engineer to look at the sounds in the area, which we will do because we're redoing the whole uh, outside deck uh, right now. We'll put limiter, any type of limiters on our, our music systems. I understand you not, you don't like that music, but you know, we would like the opportunity just to have a little bit of ambiance. I know you heard that before. And um, and again, I just like to put that out there. Our, our banquet space is in the lower level. These this is an area where it uh, it's concrete below one level. You shouldn't hear any of that. Everybody will exit out of the Duffield side. I'm sorry, I apologize. The Flatbush side of the building. So we won't allow congregating. We have people that are in security capacities. We'll have Bellman here. We'll keep the flow of traffic going. Our employees are going to be trip, tip trained. So everybody will know how to uh, serve alcohol and not serve to excess. And again, that's just not the business we're in. We're a guest-centric organization. Uh, we have a lot to offer and we're excited about being here and we want to work with the community and work with you all and I'm here now and have been here since uh, we took over in November 9th. We're closed right now. We look to open to the general public again as far as being an operating hotel beginning in February. And again, my name is Robert Gormley and uh, I will answer any questions you have or invite anybody over to the hotel to do any type of walk arounds or site visits that you may want. But again, I do understand uh, your frustration and what you had to deal with in the past. I am very sympathetic. I have seen some of my, in my past life, these type of dealings and these things go on. 
but that's just not what I tolerate that we're going to do. And I speak for the owners as well when I say that. That's just not our business. So thank you very much for giving me the time to speak. And as I said, I open door. You're right across the street. I'm across the street. So if there's other questions I can answer, please feel free. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Um, I, I will just note, and I hope you all can understand that this, this isn't the, uh, really an ordinary application that's in front of us. This is probably what has proved to be the most uh, concerning establishment in the entire community district in the past five years for our committee. Um, and I understand it may not be from the specific ownership or management that's in front of us, but we frankly have dealt with multiple managements and multiple ownerships in respect of this uh, area and the uh, uh, there's been issues that have concerned that and the concerns have continued. But I have one question and then I'll turn it over to my committee and then the community and hopefully we can all wrap this up and I may put some time limits on different on different questions and responses just to try to move things along. But Mr. Bernstein, you indicated that this was not subject to the 500 foot rule. And I wanted to ask you as an attorney, um, have you considered, I, we're not the arbiters of the 500 foot rule, but I understand it makes the difference between whether there's a presumption or in favor or against at the SLA level. Have you measured and considered whether Amarachi, Hampton Inn, Boyadoro create the 500 foot rule presumption? I believe that we had a surveyor go out there and do the measurements. Um, I don't have those in front of me, but the 500 foot rule to be triggered, there have to be three uh, full on premises licenses within 500 feet and there, there apparently are not. Okay, well, Hampton Inn is definitely there because that's across the street. I, yeah, I, I don't see be, the argument the there. One. The other ones seem like they might be a little debatable. But um, I, I would encourage you to investigate that so that the information yeah, is properly reflected before the SLA. Absolutely. Um, at this point, I will ask the members of the committee if they have any questions. And I will say, Brandon. I think, we, go ahead, Mr. This is Alejandro. Um, Carilla, yes, thank you. Thank you. I just, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, trying to keep a very open mind here and treat every sort of applicant as if it were new, not tag you with the history of the previous owners. But it, if, if memory serves, it feels to me that the history of this space isn't just poor management. It is it's structural. There's an issue here in that this veranda or this patio or this outside space, uh, the noise just sort of bleeds out to the, to the, the residents. And that is the big issue. So unless there's going to be some you know, sort of major structural work. I don't know if it's like a glass barrier, if that's going to rise several more feet. I, I mean, I don't, I don't even know if that would work, but the limiters that you're talking about, and I just read a little bit about them. Thank you, Tay and the board office for sending that information. Just doesn't feel like it's, it's going to do the trick. So, um, you know, barring something completely structural that's going to change here, I don't, I don't see how this is going to improve the situation from the previous owners and, and managers and, and, my, my plan is to vote against. Okay. Did you did you want the applicants to respond, Mr. Varela, or I I I figure your your statement is kind of a statement more than a question. I mean, if there's I mean, if there's something to be said, on, I mean, I'll, I'll hear it. I'm I'm trying to keep an open mind here. Okay. Just as there's no questions raised, I'm going to move on and then hope if there's anything they want to raise after the next question, then they can they can jump in. Um, were there any other questions from members of the committee? Yeah, can you see me? Cobb. Ms. Cobb, yes. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation again. I'm, I listen. But my question is, again, um, have or will the issues of concern for us in the community be addressed? You know, and I think that had to do with the noise, one of the things. Um, so, is that or will that be addressed? Well, if I may, uh, yes, it's it's definitely be addressed. I, as I said, I, I've heard and listened. I did speak to one person in the community and I appreciate the uh, feedback that he gave. We actually spoke for quite a bit of time. And 
as I said, I've I've experienced these type of situations before, and there are ways of running menus uh, in a way, in a manner in which they're not uh, impacting our neighborhood. And as a community, I'm a neighbor too. And again, we're a landlord as well. We're going to have 63 tenants living in this hotel. You're aware that there are apartments upstairs. Uh, we're going to be sensitive to that. We're not going to just say, well, that's not my problem. As well as the general manager, I'm also sensitive, and I truly am, I'm just not saying this, to the guests in the hotel. Again, we're guest-centric. And I'm not going to do things that are going to affect the guests, but also I'm not going to do things that uh, I, I think would affect the community. And, and I gave my phone number, and, and I'm sorry if not everybody uh, received the letters. But I gave my, my uh, email address as well as my personal cell phone. And I know I've heard other people say, well, they've done that before. And I heard the actions of the general manager. But you're just going to find that real hospitality and professional organization. And we pride ourselves on our reputation. And we do care. And I mean that sincerely. I care. I'm just, I'm not a bar operator. I'm just not, the t I have to be here in the morning. I have to listen to everybody in the morning. And it's just not always about the neighbors. It's also about the people that stayed in the hotel. Said, I couldn't sleep last night. Your bar was just out of sight, if that was the case. And again, we will listen to you. I will listen to you. And there's people within my organization above me that will listen. But we will definitely uh, want to be a part of it. And as I said into the previous comment about what is that and what are these limiters and what are these the, the redesigning of the space. All this is possible. And there are type of uh, speakers that are audible, but they're no louder than a person talking. So yes, there's gonna be people out there and they'll be talking, speakers will be going off. We're gonna redesign it in a manner in which uh, it's more spread out. We're not putting beer pong tables up there. We're not gonna encourage drinking anymore. It's just, it's just not what we're about. So I just want to I just want to add, if I can, that when I read through the prior resolution and I see the, dis the discussion there, there are comments about the fact that they don't do DJs outside anymore, which leads me to believe that at some point they had a DJ outside. Uh, another comment, the problem is live music outdoors. Um, we would not do that. There's a woman singing into a microphone that was amplified outdoors, not something that uh, we would do. Uh, the space is rented out. We're not hot. We're not renting out that 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 space. Uh, the new owners are not here. Uh, they have no history running a hotel. I think we've hit that point already. So I, I, you know, I think that those are some distinguishing characteristics. And I think, as as Robert said, that they would hire an acoustic engineer to evaluate that uh, that terrace and determine what um, acoustic uh, what things that they can do. Um, sometimes there are planters. Sometimes you can put up a, uh, a glass uh, or acrylic wall that, that helps. Um, in terms of sound, I understand that music is, is an issue for you for outdoor space. I think that they would like to have the opportunity to have it with the understanding that it would be designed by an acoustic engineer. Because sometimes what they do is they put in a lot of very small speakers and that lets the speakers be turned to a very low volume because if you have a lot of them, they don't have to be pumped up loud and the limiter would be set at a level that it could not be heard by the residents. Um, so I, I think to answer the question, there are some affirmative steps that, that can be taken. Okay, well, thank you. Were there any other questions from members of the committee? Uh, I'll then go on to the community um, noting the late hour. All right, I'm gonna move on to the community. I'm gonna ask everyone for the, the sake of all of us, I think there is some understanding of this application on this committee to the level that we may not have with other applications because we've seen it so many times. But if you could try to keep your comments somewhat brief, we will do the two minutes, but certainly appreciate if anyone can go um, under that. And I will start with Mr. Randy Moore. Mr. Moore, you're on mute. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, I think it was a very um, sound, and I have to preface by saying I make my business in the uh, event space. I've uh, been doing it for 12, 13 years. 
And I think it comes down to several things. One, communication, which I think I've heard, you know, at least there's a difference between this ownership group and past ownership groups. But I think it, the real key here is that um, not only the acoustics, but it's, it's the, the people who tend to, to uh, uh, frequent these kinds of uh, events. I mean, they just block up the, the parking, at least in the past. And we've lived here at 42 Duffield Street for going on three years. Now, it's not the general New Yorkers. It's people from uh, the bridge and tunnel crowd from, from my day. Uh, they're loud. They're disrespectful. Um, even after, and I think there's been some, tried to, the, the group tried to improve things, but the people just don't listen. They're just not the kind of people that that normally come to a neighborhood like this. They're loud. We live on the ground floor. People smoke both weed and, and uh, tobacco in front of our uh, uh, building. They're loud. I've had to go out and address these people sometimes. And they're just abusive people that you just don't want in your neighborhood. So I, I appreciate that the candor and the uh, and the purposefulness of uh, the new um, perspective owners, but between the noise, the crowd, and the, the kind of uh, residential neighborhood, and we used to live in on Adams Street, where it was noise was just prevalent. You know, between helicopters and traffic, we just don't see this as being a, vi a viable uh, venue for this neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Moore, and you were within two minutes. Appreciate it, uh, Mr. Thank Begg. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I, I'd like to put forward a specific proposal as, uh, as you requested in the chat. Um, and that is for the, for the community board to recommend disapproval with conditions. Um, and specifically, uh, the conditions for approval in the future should be to re-apply uh, for the license without the second floor space. The complaints that have been legion against the uh, previous owners of the business have all been surrounding the second floor space. We don't hear a peep from the basement venue and there have been plenty of um, um, events happen in that basement venue that don't create any sound noise other than people leaving, which uh, is a separate issue that I'm sure we could work with the hotel constructively on. The sound coming from the second floor space, and, uh, and there's a picture there on the screen. You see that the shape of the hotel is basically, that's 120 degree angle, more or less, and it amplifies any sound from that terrace, which you can see at the bottom of the, the L shape, directly into this very quiet residential block. So uh, I don't believe there's any soundproofing you could do at the second floor level, because it's the entire height of the hotel that effectively creates a band shell for any noise on that terrace. Um, and you'll see it also goes into uh, backyards on Duffield Street. So even, even people's backyards and, and the back um, is not immune. And the current picture you can see there shows that um, the entirety of the second floor space is an outdoor bar. Um, the interior is that very small space that you could see there. So the, um, the only space available is the outdoor space. Um, so it just isn't possible to have uh, any kind of amplified noise there in that second floor space without it being outdoors. It is only an outdoor space. So the, um, the request that I'd, I'd put forward is, is for, the, um, for the owners to come back with a new application requiring um, uh, applying for the license to be in the basement and lobby areas only and for there to be no license on the second floor. Failing that, if they must have uh, a license for the second floor, then there would be a stipulation for no amplified sound um, at all um, because of that band shell effect. It's got to be Mr. Big, I wanted you to get your motion out, but you're about a half minute over the two minutes. Thank so you very much. I'm going to stop you at that point. Ms. But Evers, was... you're, up, you're up next. Thank you. First of all, to the committee, um, you've stuck with us through this, um, and we really do appreciate your service to the greater community um, and your understanding how trying this has been for all of us. Um, you know, none of us are against business per se, um, but part of the problem with this application process is that 
we have to kind of take your word unless there are stipulations. Um, and you're still in the process of setting up the space. Um, as you said, you haven't had an acoustic person in to, to see what can be done. Um, and you're asking us to take your word when we've been messed with repeatedly. Um, instead of coming to us with solutions and with data um, saying these are the noise levels, this is what we're going to do, it's all these things and we have to take your word for it for two years. Um, that's, you know, the, the next renewal would be in two years and we're stuck in the meantime. <clears throat> I also want to point out um, I haven't heard anything about traffic control. Duffield is a one lane street, basically. Um, even with um, valet parking at some of these events in the past, the cars were lined up, emergency vehicles could not get through. Um, I have pictures and video evidence of that. Um, you have a very limited parking space down below. So like, I would wanna hear what solutions you have for that. We are a 10 minute walk minimum from all subway stations. So you, you're not expecting people to necessarily all take public transport. So what are you gonna do with all the cars of people coming to these events? It's bad enough with hotel parking. Um, so Ms. Evers, it's, you're, you're yeah. a little bit over the two minutes at this Sorry. point. So I'm gonna Thank stop you, you there. for your time. Um, Mr. 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 Chair, Mr. Varela. This is Alejandro. I just wanted to throw out that um, I'm in agreement with with the proposal that Mr. Begg had put forth, and I would happily put it through as an as a motion if well, the other uh, residents agree, and it would. And this is essentially what everyone's going to say. I would happily do that. Okay. I, well, that's 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 great to know. Mm -hmm. But if we could allow the other residents to speak, I think that would be helpful, and it'll give the applicants a, a little time to respond, as we did with the other folks, and then we'll we'll have our discussion and vote. Um, Mr. Juan from Bridge Plaza, welcome back. Two minutes on the clock. All right. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and let me welcome you to the neighborhood. Okay. N you know. It's great that you that you come in to us and a hotel. We need a hotel. We have friends and people that come in. And this hotel, even prior ownership, the problem is this terrace and it's sound. That you know, there are other issues, but that is it. And music under no motion should music be allowed in that terrace. I see in your application you have background music. The problem is that what is background music? Uh, you know, and the staff typically in hotels. I stayed in hotels all over the world. It's the staff, they put the music and we call and you're not gonna be there. Everybody here has the number of the previous manager, et cetera, et cetera. And as, as Patty says, we have to trust you. And I wanna trust you, but there is no, and I think Andrew mentioned it, uh, there's no feasible way of having uh, the amplified uh, sound or music in that terrace. And I don't think, I think that's just a small part of your business and your business is at a hotel. It's not a bar, it's not a restaurant, it's, a, you know, it's an am amenity to your customers. You have tenants and you have hotels. So I think under no circumstances from my perspective, and I've been here for 32 years. And in fact, I was part of the community board when we did the zoning that allowed this hotel to go. I, I fought for many years to get the zoning done. And you are the only business actually in our neighborhood. So I think, uh, that should be taken into consideration. There should be no amplified or even background music in the terrace. They can go inside, they can go in the basement, and I don't think it should be any issue. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Uh, how about the 200 foot rule? Because I looked on the zoning and uh, somebody well, can Mr. address Mr. Juan, I, I, you're not, you, you've done a great job of staying under the two minutes, but I will just say, we are not the arbiters of the 200 foot rule or the 500 foot rule, that's the SLA. But I'll give you one more point to come back at me and then we, we got to move on. No, but I only asked it because you asked about the 500 foot rule, but the right. school, there's a school on the corner that's only a hundred, in my calculation, less than a hundred feet away. So they have to do that to SLA and, and, and Mr. Burstein has to make that representation as counsel. So I don't know. I, I, 
I, I appreciate you raising it, Mr. Wan. Miss um, Lowe. Yes, thank you, Mr. Smith, and thank you to the committee. Um, I have to say, I also agree with Mr. Begg's proposal resolution. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'd like to voice that. And hopefully that that's a good compromise for all. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Juliet. Thank you, uh, Chairperson and the committee for your support in the seven years that we've been dealing with this issue. Um, I just want to say that uh, all of Vinegar Hill's concerns is what are what Bridge Plaza has been dealing with all these years with the noise and the patrons and just horrific uh, things happening. I live on Concord Street, so I did not get the notice. But even as a resident of Concord Street, that outdoor space is a band shell effect. And as is, cannot have any amplified music or even uh, a large crowd screaming and you know revelry uh, for parties, it comes over onto Concord Street. It's been a nightmare whenever anything is happening on that terrace. Now, uh, trying to be quick here, um, Part of the issues we've had in the past, which were lack of proper management. Uh, you are a hotelier for many years, uh, Mr. Grumley. Will there be a food and beverage manager or restaurant manager on premises at all times? Is it a 24 hour um, GM you know, system, shifts, whatever? I've lived on Concord Street since 1966, so that's almost Six decades, my family has been there even longer. Uh, and even living around the corner from Tillery Street with the police station and the fire station, that space has been the noisiest and the most uncomfortable, even with windows closed and the AC on uh, during the summer months when an outdoor space is, is used most frequently. So, uh, you know, any any information about management and you said you have your number available and all of that. Um, but as other members have said, there's issues with with that as well. Thank you, Miss Juliet. Um, and thank you for staying within two minutes. We appreciate that at this time. Um, now I'll turn it back over to Mr. Bernstein and the applicants. Ms. And Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Ms. Muller. I, I just wanted, uh, Mr. Vinicombe is not able to raise his digital hand, but he's been very patient. Oh, I'm, I would never want to <laughs> take the floor away from Mr. Vinicombe. And I'm sorry, I, I, I can only do what I can see. No, no. Mr. Vinicombe, no. I will give you the same grace as everyone else, but it's nice to see you again. You too. And I, uh, I, uh, your history is great, uh, Chairman uh, Smith. It's amazing. You, you remember all this and you have it all down. And we really appreciate you and the committee staying with us for, it's been what, seven years now. It's been a, well, been a while. Um, uh, just a couple of questions, which is appropriate to this committee because it is the social uh, service committee is that and I, uh, the previous owner did have a contract with the Department of Homeless Services for a while uh, because of COVID. Uh, and we work with the uh, the local councilman, but and the community board, but they did not. The uh, the previous owners were not uh, given given any notice to uh, your uh, the community board nor the community about about that. We got through it. We understand people had to be uh, be uh, housed because of the, the things that were going on with the homeless services and the and the facilities. So we got past that. Uh, then there was a contract with the New York City Criminal Justice Agency. And it became a halfway house for a while, and the local council uh, person didn't know about it. Neither the community board knew about it. Uh, so my one question, maybe you would like to ask the new owners, is that are any of contracts still in place? We'd like to because we we weren't told about that. The community board wasn't told about it, nor were the council people. Steve Levin was the original, uh, the former, and also uh, Lincoln Ressler on what was going on there. We got through it, uh, but the fact is, I just like to know if those contracts. Are still there. The uh, the other thing is, is that uh, you know the the restrictions. There is a design flaw, and I the, 
the word band shell really describes it. It's a metallic building and it's basically a speaker. And I, I wonder sometimes if it's actually louder on the street than it is in the, in, the, in the terrace space. So that's something, it's a design issue. And the other thing about these restrictions and with the help of the community board, I think you did a great job, but when, when, the, when the, the previous owner didn't want to comply anymore, they started using the sound as a weapon and it just got ridiculous. The community board couldn't do anything about it. The council people were involved. Even the mayor's office got involved. And these restrictions were just, you know, we had, we had kind of a, almost like a hostile owner that was using sound as a weapon. So uh, I'll leave it there. You know, you, you, the history that this committee has, I need to say nothing else because you've been with us the whole way. So where, whatever you, where, I know you, you're going in the right direction. You're there for us. I appreciate your, all your help. But I'd like to just know about those two social service programs that were there, if they're going to, if they're continued, if they're ending and what these, because this is the social service committee. So it's the appropriate place to bring it to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Venicom. Um, all right. So now I'll turn it back over to the applicants. And I recognize there were a lot of questions, but there were also a lot of questions for the last applicant. To be fair, I'll uh, ask you to respond to the, the questions, including Mr. Venicombe's question um, and about the, uh, the social service contracts. And um, if you could also address how feasible it would be to have absolutely no music on the outdoor terrace, yeah. that would be helpful. So let, let, let me address that. And I think Three that, um, yeah, I think that coming into this meeting, we were well aware of the concerns with the music and the issues with the terrace, but felt though as though we we could try to um, see if we could persuade you that you know we we might be able to have music in a way that wouldn't be a hindrance. But I'm I'm hearing that there's no appetite for that, and um, so I I think what we are willing to do, uh, recognizing that and and wanting not to aggravate the situation because we understand that that the residents have had a hard time with this over the years is to agree not to have any music outside in the terrace at all amplified or otherwise um, and i think that that may go a long way in helping uh, and i think the second part of that is that my client said that even without music they would still engage in a sound and acoustic engineer uh, to come up to the site and to um uh, evaluate it and see if there are measures that can be taken to alleviate this problem. Um, so we're willing to do both of, of those things. But it, it is it is important for, the, for us, for my client, to have some use of that terrace. Uh, I think that, you know, people want to sit outside and, and have something to eat or, or have a drink. So I, I think we want to be able to use it, use it responsibly and, and also um, see if there are ways to minimize the impact. And I'll let um, Robert, you can address the other question. Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, there was a question about our, what we call manager on duty program, manager MOD. Uh, there will always be a manager on duty and that includes the overnight hours uh, as well as we do have security. Uh, we have uh, Bellman on duty to create a different layer of uh, security watching our doors. Uh, we will, as far as food and beverage managers, absolutely. We're obviously not there yet. We don't have that. Currently, right now, to be transparent, is a general manager, assistant general manager, a front office manager, a uh, sales manager, a senior sales manager. So we're very well equipped and that's just this side of it. And then the other side would be somebody that understands food and beverage and operates it in a manner which is, again, conducive to keeping the peace and, um, and doing it professionally. Uh, I, I think one of the comments that we keep hearing about renting out the space, very quickly, the, the people here before, the operators here before were doing it probably most like a, out of desperation. They were hiring promoters to go up, have parties, make a lot of money, sell a lot of booze, and uh, sell tickets. I can't emphasize enough that it is absolutely positively not what we're doing. And as a matter of fact, I, again, want to just say that I look at the second floor as more as a guest amenity at, at the most. And if people come from the outside, such as their guests, that's a place for them to meet. But we have no intentions of renting it out to uh, that type of venues. 
in addition to the housing, that I, that was some we would we're not going to do it. Uh, we have no intentions of doing it. I believe that was just something that the previous owners felt they needed to do again to they were in financial uh, disrepair and it was just something that they needed to do. We would never do that. And it just to, to put it out there, if anything was ever to be anything remotely like that, if we were ever to do anything uh, to change what we do over here, we would uh, alert the community immediately, let everybody know. But we have no intentions of doing any of that. We're going in full full hotel business. As I said, we're very excited about that. Thank you. Great. Hearing, having heard from you, having heard from the community, I'll ask the committee if there's anyone who wants to make a motion. M Mr. Smith, one, one more invisible hand, um, Board Member Lisa Scott. Oh, we have one more person who's going to ask a question. Uh, Ms. Scott, uh, you have two minutes. Sorry. Um, I'm raising my hand because I am one of the residents that lives right across from the building. Um, and um, part of the thing is, is that um, I like the community because of the fact that there are long-term residents. So we have residents that have been here for 40 or more years. And I think that's a beautiful thing. However, um, one of the things that the, and as the Dazzler and it has changed over the years, has brought its contention because of the music. It's a simple thing, right? Is that we're a, we're a quiet community. We've been here for a while and um, there has been contention sim simply because of the noise. Um, I think that the residents here are, are adapted to change because we've, they've been here for a long period of time. So that's not the issue. It's more or less that if, if they could truthfully just kind of take care of that issue of how they're going to um, modify the noise and to um, be mindful of the residents here, because we really just, I mean, it's not so much that we, we don't, we don't mind change. It's more or less just being mindful of the people that are here and people who have been here their, most of their life, um, like Mr. Vinicombe, um, um, and I think that that's the thing, it's more or less just kind of just being aware of the fact that the residents here, that they're here because they like the community and I like the community, even though I haven't been one of the long-term residents, I've only been here for about 15 years. Um, but because of the fact that like, it's just, it's just how can they modify their behavior and what they're doing in order for them to, um, I guess to be part of the community, they're outliers in my in my in my perspective. Perspective is that they're just people who are here for a short period of time and then they you know move on. And we want people who truthfully feel that they're part of the community, and they can be long term residents in some cases. That they can just be you know part of who we are. Um, so it's just it's my question is truthfully like how what are they modifying? not only for 295 front, because I was a part of that meeting as well too, but what are they modifying in their behavior in order for them to adapt to the community that's already established? Um, that's really my, um, my question to the patrons there and what we can do in order for us to kind of, I guess, to um, right. understand who they are, right? It, yeah, it's-, it's, it's Sorry, Ms. Scott. Yeah. You're 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 at about two minutes me? forty five. Yeah. Sorry, okay. I'm sorry. It's it's. But you you understand these are new applicants here. These are not the people who were in the who were rep who were um, uh, who were owning or managing the location before. Now this is a new ownership group that has taken over in November and has not yet uh, commenced. Um. So I, I, I'm, is your question, I guess, how you would, how, how they would, how, how they would do things differently than the prior owners? Yes. I'm okay. sorry. Yes. Great. So that's essentially how would they do things differently? Because we had contention with the prior owner, prior owners, because of the fact that they really didn't understand the community. And so I, I understand. Community. Yes. Great. So Mr. Bernstein and company, I, if you can succinctly in a minute or less describe how you're going to do things different than the prior owners, I, I, I would welcome that. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. Amanda, did you want to speak to that? Yeah. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. I will be very brief because I know that it's really late uh, right now. Uh, but my name is Amanda Pomeroy and I represent Ohana Real Estate Investors. Um, and, you know, we invest in full service luxury hotels. If you look on our website, you can see that we're committed to high value properties. And we intend to run this property in the same way in partnership with a real hospitality group. We partnered with them knowing their background, especially in the New York community. Um, and so we're really excited to be a part of the community. We have a commitment for all of the hotels with which um, in our various locations um, are committed to being part of the community and partners with the neighbors. And so I just wanted to make sure, you know, um, that I, I voiced that. I apologize for not speaking up sooner as, as a representative of an ownership group, but we really appreciate your consideration and completely empathize with what has happened in the past and um, can only assure you that we are we have run hotels for many years owned hotels and again in the luxury space four seasons uh ritz carlton montage hotel waldorf astoria to name a few um, to help give an example of the type of properties that we own and manage with in partnership with our management companies um, like rhg so we appreciate your consideration um, of this application Thank you. Great. Can you Thank, reach that to our you. community, by the way? Ms. Scott, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't have a whole back and forth, and I apologize for that. I just want to try to get the, the committee meeting moving. Um, is there anyone on the committee who would like to make a motion at this point? Sure, I'm happy to make a motion. Uh, right. I'll, make, I'll make a motion to um, approve and I don't think I need to add the condition uh, with no music outdoors because um, uh, Mr. Bernstein, perhaps you'll just submit an amended application. So it is knowing there will be no music outdoors uh, is my, my motion to approve. Okay. Um, so it's the application exactly the same with no, no music outdoors. That's your, that's your motion, Ms. Sersner. Okay, is there a second? I'll second it. Second Nicole from Ms. McKnight. McKnight. All right, discussion from the committee. Um, does anyone want to make a comment on the motion? I, I have some, but I will, I will reserve that for anyone else. Um, I hear, um, wait, no, Mr. Varela, go ahead. Sorry. I just want to clarify. I know it just was said. I just want to say it out loud again. We are not adding a condition of no outdoor music because they have already agreed to no outdoor music and that is sufficient and because it will be in the minutes. They'd have to submit an, an amended application. So I, I'm going to say I defer to Tay about whatever is the right way to do that. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. So I have a couple of suggestions. Um, one, I suggest that we, one, go back on the outdoor hours to at least 10 p.m. Sunday to Thursday, which would be consistent with what we've worked with previously. And um, I, I'm torn. I can be persuaded, but my my inclination would be 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. Um, the uh, the uh, the other aspect is I would make it a condition of the motion that the outdoor that there be no music outdoors. The the reason that I would suggest this is just it was critical in our ability to raise a stipulation or a a a concern to the SLA before that we had agreed to that and having that in our in our output of our decision would be i think helpful regardless of how things proceed so th those would be my two proposed amendments um second okay um any other discussion from members of the committee all right Mr. Um, Smith, can i can i just comment on what you said well, Mr. Bernstein, 
I normally make it easier would for not you. allow <laughs> folks to jump in, but yeah, if you can comment that. We're okay. Be, we're okay, okay with the briefly. 10 p.m. We're okay with 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday. And, and we're okay making, if, if you choose to, to make the no music outside a condition. We'll withdraw it from our application, but we can give you a belt and suspenders on that. Great. Okay. Are you okay with the 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday as well? Uh, I have to have my client speak to that. Okay. I haven't gotten that. any message. I think they still would like midnight on the weekends. Oh, okay. Well, I thought we had someone from the Ohana group on the, on the call. Yes, I think midnight is still what they would like on Friday and Saturday, but they would do 10 ah. p.m. during the week. And after okay. midnight, the the patrons would go indoors. Would be the correct. Would be it would the be request. No patrons. No patrons after midnight. Okay. Well, we'll we'll discuss that as the as a committee and see what what folks think. Um, so the motion as it stands is no outdoor music. Um, the outdoor is closing at 10 p.m. Sunday to Thursday, 11 p.m. Friday and Saturday. Um, were there any, is there anyone from the committee who has a comment or, 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 or feels like we should make any more amendments to the motion? I agree with the 11 p.m. and I would suggest to the applicants to I'll agree with that in good, you know, as a good faith offering. And then when your renewal is up, uh, pending, you know, no uh, run-ins with the community, that would be a great time to apply for admit, um, extended hours. Yeah, that, that's a that's a fair suggestion. I think what we would really all like to see, because frankly, in the years since 2015 when this has occurred the community hasn't been consistently coming to us and telling us to reject this license they've been willing to support different owners and managers who are operating this location and with the with with an understanding that they can be um, sympathetic to the local community and i think there's nothing we would like more than to see if um the uh, than to have two years go by and there not to be any concerns expressed or you know maybe a small number of concerns but you know really not the level of concerns we've seen consistently with this because we don't want to go on having meetings like this really and we really do want businesses in our community to succeed. Um, we'll do it. There, we'll do that. We'll go along with ten and eleven. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Um, all right. Any other questions or comments from the committee? No. Nope. All right. Having heard this, I vote in favor of the motion. Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. Uh, Ms. McKnight, how do you vote? In favor. Mr. Varela, how do you vote? In favor. Uh, Mr. Ryan, how do you vote? In favor. Okay. Um, Mr. Varela, how do you vote? Did you hear me? In favor? I got you, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Varela. I get to vote twice? Oh, I'm sorry. You, the thing is, you bounce around my squares, so I don't know when you're coming up. <laughs> I voted Ms. in favor Cobb. the first time. Okay. M Ms. Cobb, how do you vote? In favor. Okay. Uh, I know I've already asked Ms. McKnight. Ms. Anadu is somewhere. There she is. Ms. Anadu, in favor. how do you vote? Okay, Ms. Cumberbatch. In favor. Uh, Ms. Einhorn. In favor. All right. Is there anyone else on the committee that I missed? You got Ms. Cobb? Yes. Did I, did I get you, Ms. Cobb? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, you. I got you? Okay, great. All right. Well, you're unanimously approved. As with everyone else, I wish you luck. But what I'm really wishing is that we have a, a symbiotic relationship with the community and there's somebody on staff, you know, all the time to answer concerns or, and that we don't have to have another meeting that is about this 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 location. So and I wish you luck with your business. So thank, thank you very you so much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. All right.
Next up, we've got renewals. Um, we've got 54J, Olympia Wine Bar, 487 Atlantic, Eastville Comedy Club, 71 Lafayette, Fancy Free, 590 Fulton, Peaches Prime at Gotham Market, 60 Furman, one hotel ETC, 68 Willoughby, Bon Chan. Um, Ms. Muller, have there been any concerns expressed to the board office or complaints regarding any of these locations? There have been none. Okay. Um, does any committee member, board member, or member of the public have any concerns or, or want to be heard with regard to the renewal applications? And actually, Mr. Smith, I should amend. There have been none. Uh, specifically regarding one hotel, which previously had had several, but there have been no complaints this year. Okay, well, th this year is only four days old. How about last year? <laughs> the night has been a whole year long. <laughs> I know, I know. I just do want to say, uh, I know of two complaints that have been submitted to this community board for 71 Lafayette for Fancy Free. Uh, those have oh. been through email. So I just want to make sure that those were received and uh, noted here. We did receive uh, an email back from the community board to both of those emails. Okay. And I'm sorry if I if I missed you, but but Liz R, uh, would you mind stating your full name for the record? I'm sorry. I just want to make sure it gets captured. In the of notes. course, it's Liz Rawson. I Thank could update very my name now, and I would love to make a statement. Uh, for the renewal of Fancy Free, if I could be granted two minutes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's why we Great. ask. Go ahead. Amazing. Well, thank you. I promise to even under two minutes, but I do apologize. I am quite under the weather. So I will submit um, the written statement, Jessica, to you so you can have it in case you miss anything. Uh, Fancy Free's noise pollution has been out of control with that blast bass heavy music most of nights of the week, often late into the night. On weekends, they bring in professional DJs with large PA systems that blast music louder and later. I'll note that Fancy Free's current liquor license only lists background music and occasional live acoustic and jazz as permitted music options. Fancy Free is on the ground floor of 71 Lafayette, a corner building with multiple residential apartments and homes around them. Myself, my husband, and multiple neighbors have pleaded with Fancy Free owners and staff to lower the noise pollution for the year and a half that they've been open. When we've gone down to plead with them to turn it down, the bartenders have multiple times taunted us and told us to move out. If and when they do lower the music, they turn it right back up when we leave, just as they do when the police arrive due to 311 complaints. In 2022 alone, police took action 42 times to have them lower the volume. We understand that this is New York City, but Fancy Free does not care that they moved into established mixed residential and commercial neighborhood and that they share physical space with residents. The previous tenant, Mullane's, was a bustling sports bar that caused zero noise pollution for the upstairs apartments. We and other neighbors lived in perfect harmony with that bar and never once issued or have noted a noise complaint against them when we searched the 311 records. We supported them like we do every other business in this neighborhood. In very recent days, as Fancy Freeze liquor licenses come up for renewal, the music has been mildly quieter. While we are not asking you to deny Fancy Free their license, I would like to request that a motion be put forth that the, license, that the license is approved with a requirement that Fancy Free install soundproofing, a limiter on both the bar system and any external PA system brought in, and any other tangible measures to permanently lower the music, specifically the bass and noise coming from the bar that any board members could recommend. I appreciate it. I'm so sorry it's so late, but I appreciate you giving me the time. All right. Thank you, Ms. Robin. I appreciate that. Now, I know that there's someone else who's raised their hand, Dan Boscov Ellen. Um, Mr. Boscov Ellen, are you here with respect to the same location or a different location? Uh, same location. I live, I live upstairs from Liz. So um, I just wanted oh, to. Oh, okay. Uh, if you I can have your, you I, can I, have your two minutes now. Okay, great. Um, yeah, just really briefly, I just wanted to pretty much um, echo um, Liz's comments. Um, you know, we uh, have been back and forth with Fancy Free uh, a lot about this problem, um, which, you know, is the worst on weekends um, where they went, as um, as mentioned, despite the fact that their um, their initial application, they said they would occasionally have like live jazz and acoustic shows um, every weekend. They bring they bring in DJs, but sometimes during the week, too. Um, last month, they had 
um, an insanely loud one on a Tuesday night. Um, you know, I'm I'm a philosophy professor and I had to teach the next morning and it was, you know, we were up until like 1.30 or whatever, whenever they decided to turn it down. Um, and we've had similar um, experiences also with the bar staff, you know, like I'm always very polite when I call down, um, you know, we always wait until like after 11 or, or whatever, when we're trying to go to sleep um, to call down and just ask them politely to turn down the music. And I've had people be like, well, sorry, you live above a bar, you know, um, uh, even though like we lived here <laughs> before this bar <laughs> moved in, right? Um, and, and I likewise had no um, problems with, with Mullane's. Um, so I, I I just want to echo what Liz said also about like I don't I'm not asking for the liquor license to be denied, but it would be great to have some sort of um, tangible recommendation from the committee that tries to get them to actually like enforce what they said in their initial application, which is that they are not going to you know they didn't mention that they were going to be trying to like run a nightclub on the weekends basically. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, and and thanks for the thirty seconds back you gave us too. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Muller, have you heard anything regarding this location or you, you familiar, have you had any correspondence with these folks? I, I, I want to understand what the board office's position on this is. I am looking to confirm, but. And do we know the status of this license and whether we must make the decision on it tonight? <laughs> so reviews are actually classified as administrative review because the community boards do not have an advisory role on reviews. These are typically administered by the district manager, which is technically still empty. Yeah. Um, the... So, oh, go ahead. I'm glad, no, I, I guess my question is, is really just in terms of like the, you know, if we don't have a timeline, then I, I would, what I would suggest, and let me know if there's any way this wouldn't be feasible, is that we contact Fancy Free, we give them an opportunity to come back before the committee, answer the concerns, talk to us about what soundproofing standards they have, and and then we we pick this up on in a in a future meeting. Um, but I, I I don't know if there's any constraint upon that that would exist. The SLA's recommendation in this case is that, um, well, there are two things. City, I'm going to share something really quick with you. So the city's recommendation, this was my response to Ms. Rawson, and I copied it here to protect the privacy of her email. Um, so these are the recommendations in long form, because uh, complaints about bars are probably the most common complaints to the office, right? So the city's response is here, right? The state's recommendation is to submit a complaint directly to the SLA, although it also says on that same website that they do not promise or typically offer follow-up to a single source complaint. So we recommend typically as above with the 311 um, to do this in, in, in Consort with your neighbors or block association, et cetera, right? And then, of course, we always suggest coming, submitting comments to this liquor renewal review. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I did pull the 311. Well, Ms. Ross, and you actually it's... cannot interrupt unless yeah. acknowledged by chair. Let, let, let's, all, let's all take it back a second here, because what I think we, we should do is we have to get through this meeting and the, the first step is dealing with the other liquor licenses that are not 71 Lafayette. So for 54 J, 487 La Atlantic, 590 Fulton, 60 Furman, and 68 Willoughby, does anyone want to make a motion on, um, on, those, uh, on those items? Motion to approve. Motion from Jessica. Second, any discussion on this motion? Um, hearing none, with respect to those to those specific items and not 71 Lafayette, um, is there anyone who opposes or abstains from voting in favor of this this application? If if you if you do, please say so now.
Okay. So we considered those those items um, approved. We're down to 71 Lafayette, fancy free. Um, my, my suggestion is that, and, and honestly, it's just a suggestion because anyone has the floor and I'm not gonna make a motion, but I will make a suggestion. The suggestion is that I think we need to get in contact with fancy free we need to um, at least get their point of view. And I, I, I'd like to, to potentially um, uh, table this over until we can, we can have an actual discussion about this, which is has all the parties involved. But that's my, my suggestion. I'm open to take motions to, and, and I invite anyone else to, to make a motion to the contrary. Um, I'm also thinking because I saw in that response that it was also suggested to bring in mediation. So perhaps prior to the meeting with us, they can make arrangements to meet with N MEND NYC. Okay. Well, let's discuss that. I, I think that there there could be something in that. In that regard, but I, the you know it always it always takes two to tango when it comes to um, mediation, so um, and it's a lot easier to have that conversation when you have the people here in the in the room and what we have are our uh, specific uh, residents who who have a concern, but we have no um, applicant here as part of the meeting. Um, I'll make a motion to table. I agree. I agree with your suggestion, Brandon. And I think any specific suggestions, mediation or otherwise, have to wait until we actually talk with the applicant. Because just, I, I just want, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but the board, the SLA does not accept recommendations from community boards regarding renewals. Or, so we can't even. Well, we, we've given recommendations on renewal applications for the last 10 years. And we voted on this at every, and we just voted on five others for uh, a different, uh, for the for the different establishments here, um, I I want to do something that's defensible, and I want to do something that is taking into account the different views that exist. And I don't have all of the views in this room, so I I I mean I I'm sympathetic to to hearing the the the, the, the concerns expressed by the residents, but I, I I feel like our committee has an uh, has an has a, uh, a a duty if we're going to do anything to hear from the the establishment as well too or at least give them an opportunity to show up and if the sla decides to disregard what we're going to do then we didn't even have any reason to talk about this in the first place but i um i i think given the 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 fact that there there should be um some further discussion about it i, I will second J jessica's motion to to table this and and um, at this point, I invite any discussion on the motion to table that item on the agenda. May I ask a quick question? I'm very sorry to unmute myself. Well, we're in committee discussion right now, so I'm sorry, Liz, but we have to be fair as just as you know, other people don't wanna do this, wanna ask questions during our committee discussions for other motions and such, we, 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 we wanna try to make the decision as a committee. And um, I'm gonna ask if any other members of the committee have questions or comments on the motion to table. If whatever we do now won't, won't happen before the, re, the 30 day clock is, is complete. Is that correct? Well, I don't think there is a thirty-day clock in this regard. This is a this is a renewal application. I may, granted, look, I'm not going to profess to be an expert in in liquor license law, Miss um, Muller. I, I was trying to get at this point earlier, but perhaps you can better explain this in regards to thirty-day clocks and liquor license app and renewal applications. Is that something we need to think about? So the 30-day municipal rule 
means that the applicant is required to submit notice of their either new application or renewal application to the municipal entity and then wait 30 days before submitting to the state liquor authority. That gives us 30 days to um, confirm receipt of the notice and to schedule this meeting. Um, mm. Problem is <laughs> with renewals, there is no, there is a formal submission process and a formal submission entity that receives board, uh, community board recommendations for new license applications. There is no submission process or formal entity to receive board recommendations regarding renewals. Those are typically managed at the district office level. The letter that I shared screen to show you is one example of how a district office might help manage uh, situations such as this when they arise. Um, I do apologize in this particular case, I didn't receive a response to that letter. So I did not realize that Ms. Rawson's complaint was um, specifically related to this. It was also several months ago. I didn't realize it was related to this particular review. Okay. I would be happy to work with Ms. Rawson, but I, I, I think at the risk of being repetitive, I, I think that they need to, the, the neighbors need to take steps to try some of the five remedies that were suggested because th those are really the only enforceable options that we can offer. Right, but I mean, can we really even offer any enforceable options with respect to a renewal? I, I, I get, I, maybe that's the same point. I, to be clear, not enforceable by us. Um, our our right. job is just by to provide the SLA, information. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Our, our job, the district office's job is just to provide information and make sure that citizens have are aware of all of the avenues of recourse they have, right? So there, we have found five possible means to resolution. Um, most people, unfortunately, go straight to reporting to 311, which um, typically puts fuel on the fire. I highly recommend right. Mend NYC. Right. But you can't have mediation, and I know this, without two parties agreeing to it. And without having the applicants here at this meeting, we have no idea whether they'd be completely in favor of doing Mend NYC or completely against doing Mend NYC. Right, um, the, the real power of Mend NYC to that point, Mr. Smith, which is great, the real power of Mend NYC is that it is a city system, it's a city program, and an applicant's, a, a license holder's refusal to participate in Mend NYC is actually noted by the SLA. Well, I mean, I guess that we 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 can say that we want them to do it, but I just I, I I feel like that's something that would be very hard to potentially enforce at this. I mean, granted, I think it would be different if we were sitting here at a meeting with the folks from Fancy Free and they were telling us that we would that they agree to do Mend NYC. If we could do that, then I would absolutely stand behind it. But I I just I don't feel comfortable supporting a motion of any kind other than tabling it unless there's actually an applicant in front of me because I don't have two sides to the story. And I, you know, I, I just, that that's not, that's part of every item that we review here. Now we have a motion to table on the count, on the, on, on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, on the, the docket. Um, and the the next step per procedure is to invite for any other comments on the motion. Um, are there any other comments from members of the committee on the motion to table? All right, hearing none, um, I vote in favor of the motion to table. Um, Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. Uh, Mr. Varela, how do you vote? Honestly, I don't know. I'm going to abstain. Okay. Ms. McKnight, how do you vote? In favor. Okay. Um, Mr. Ryan, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Cobb, how do you vote? 
In favor. Ms. Cumberbatch, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Anadu, how do you vote? In favor. Great. And did I? Oh, Miss Einhorn, how do you vote? In favor. Okay. Uh, did I miss anyone on the committee? Okay. The motion to table has been uh, granted, and we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda. Next item is chair report. I'm going to spare everybody at this hour giving a chair report, other than to note that for the health fair, I filed the permit application. The um, the folks at the uh, at the parks department, I spoke with them today, told me that they're up to reviewing the application submitted in November of 2022, but they think that they will get to this application next week, maybe. And with that in mind, I would imagine it'll be a few weeks and we'll hear something and we can pick up that discussion at a later point, but it's really just too late to have much more of a discussion after these, these massive discussions tonight. So I'm gonna suggest we move on to other committee business and I'm gonna ask, the uh, the members of the committee, if they have any other business that they'd like to raise. I'd like to say something. In the past, we've had, uh, we had an organization come and talk about um, the many ways in which restaurants could be adaptable for seniors or for older residents. And there's, there was a list of things. There was a guide. I, it doesn't have to happen today. I just want to kind of put it on our radar that I, I think we should revisit that guide and see if there's anything we can add to the application for, I don't know, it doesn't have to be this season, it can be next, but um, there were lots of helpful things around lighting, around carpeting, around all these things. And we have an older, our, our district is older than most other districts in the city. And so these are things that we should sort of be ahead of and we could lead on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Varela. Um, and I'm sorry, my my mind is just kind of losing it at this hour. You said you wanted, you, this is gonna be a guide and what specifically for older people will this guide do? It was just a kind of a, a list of things that restaurants should consider for their older customers in terms of safety, okay. in terms of accessibility. Ah, it dovetailed gotcha. with ADA compliance, but it was very specific to sort of aging. And uh, we talked about it. We didn't follow up on it, I don't think. And um, and I think would you would you be interested in spearheading this project, Mr. Varela? Yes, I would. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Let's talk about it at a future meeting, Miss um, Nadu. Um, given all the recent news about um, cannabis and the first uh, places opening and different things going on, it, I just thought it might be helpful if potentially we could get someone from the OCM to come present at an upcoming meeting just to give us updates? The OCM has just missed their deadline on their social justice requirement. They are completely swamped and will not be speaking to any community boards. The Borough Hall, Borough Hall has requested their presence and specifically requested a, a borough-wide uh, hearing, which has not been scheduled. The update for Brooklyn is that there is currently an injunction because an applicant has successfully sued the state, which is preventing the release of 63 of 150 something licenses in Brooklyn, Westchester, the Hudson Valley, et cetera. So we will not be seeing any licenses for review on that anytime soon. Thank you. <laughs> All right, great. Um, just to keep in mind for everyone, this is just committee members because this is other committee business. Uh, does anyone, else from the committee have other business they want to raise during the other business section. All right. Before we move to there is one um, hand. I, I see we have Mr. Okay. Salazar, but but we're not we're not at that point in the agenda there. Uh, and I will get to that in just a second. I want to say regarding the health fair, 
we need to probably have a, uh, a group discussion uh, among the folks who are interested and in, in considering how we're going to um, uh, we're going to meet and and talk about all the next steps with the application once it gets approved. Clearly, there's a sound permit and other things, but I think you know we we don't have the time to discuss it tonight at this meeting. I'll try and take it forward to raise it at executive committee. And if you are interested in participating and maybe you didn't attend one of the prior meetings, I've, I've already got several people on an email, but if you're not on the email, you don't know, you didn't get my email about the license or, or what have you, um, definitely reach out to me and I'll loop you into the correspondence. If you're a member of the board or the committee, we, we want to have as many people participate and help as possible. Um, so moving on from other committee business, community forum. And we have Mr. Juan uh, from Bridge Plaza. Um, I am grateful to have you back for this, but try to, if you could try to keep your comment brief, I know we've heard from you a few times already. I'm gonna keep it to 15 seconds. And the only reason is to just thank you guys for your dedication and professionalism. It's nearly 10 o'clock and it's, uh, it's very impressive. And uh, thank you again for, for your commitment because I would have uh, left already if I was in the committee. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Juan. I, I greatly appreciate it, and we we wish you the best. Um, anyone else for community forum? All right. And I know I missed some board members in the course of the meeting. I saw Ms. Masso. I saw Ms. Rasco. Um, and I thank you for coming to the meeting. It's great to have board members attend our meetings. Um, and at this point, does anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? I do. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. I seconded. Ooh, who seconded? I'm sorry. I said Nicole did. Ms. McKnight. Oh, sorry, Nicole. <laughs> you, you've been buried under my squares. All right. Does anybody oppose or abstain from adjourning? I hear nothing. Great. We're adjourned unanimously. Thank you Thank all you, for your